Today we are here with Razib Khan, the world famous geneticist, um, <laughs> or infamous, or or for that matter, infamous. Um, Let's keep it real. I, I would I'd love basically for for you to start and tell us a little bit about yourself. You've got some really interesting Substacks. Yeah. Um, can, can you give us a little bit of background yeah, before yeah, we I'll sort of jump in? Yeah, I'll give you a bio. Uh, let's start from uh, let's start from the present and maybe a little bit into the past just to give some context. Uh, so the two things that I'm I'm doing I'm actually um, I am we are out of stealth so I'm going to be open about this. Uh, I actually do spend most of my working time uh, on my startup called Generate. Yes. Um, and generate, we're doing data storage management analysis in the genomic space. And, um, you know, just the simple elevator pitch or, you know, however you want to say it, you know, we went from one genome 20 years ago to about a million genomes now. We went from the $3 billion genome to the $100 genome. So you can imagine the exp ex explosion of data. In fact, um, the cost of sequencing. So, you, you know, sequence for base pair, um, there's 3 billion base pairs in a human genome. Uh, actually beat Moore's law for six years between 2010 and 2016. So it was Not really bad. running up against, you know, just basically like storage and compute and all these things. It's a little bit more under control right now, but in the near future, it looks like it's going to start crashing again because of competition. Hmm. So, you know, Generate exists kind of to serve this explosion of data because the data has a lot of interesting, important, actionable things in it, like, you know, precision medicine, um, you know, with the COVID, you know, uh, pandemic, there was a lot of sequencing going on. I think like the sequencing of SARS coronavirus one took three months. And I think the sequencing of SARS coronavirus two took like a day. Wow. Yeah. And, and as you know, the sequencing continued for a long time. It's kind of like tamping down now, but we were tracking all the sequences and all these. We didn't know any of that back then. So um, that's what I'm doing. Um, Generate is actually like most of my attention, my labor. Um, now, what many people know me from uh, is my Substack. And the Substack is uh, called Razib Khan's Unsupervised Learning. You go to razib.substack.com. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and for Generate, just go to generate.com, G-E-N-R-A-I-T.com. Okay. okay. Uh, but in any case, uh, for Razib.com or Razib.substack.com, uh, that's kind of like the culmination of maybe 20 years of writing, uh, often but not always at the intersection of genetics and history. Mm -hmm. I am uh, a geneticist by training. Uh, I went to UC Davis, uh, everything but dissertation, so I'm not a doctor. But um, right. you know, I stayed there for five years. And before that, I have uh, degrees from University of Oregon in biochemistry and biology with a focus on genetics. But I also have had a passion for history. Um, and that's just like a, a personal passion, but uh, anybody who's, I think, read my stuff knows that, uh, you know, I just know a lot of that, <laughs> okay? Sure. So I've kind of monetized that in my career. Um, and so in the past, I worked for National Geographic. Uh, I worked for Family Tree DNA. I have worked for the co-founder of 23andMe um, mm -hmm. in the personal genomic space where I bring together kind of my geneticist computational biology know-how with my knowledge of ethnography and history. And so with the Substack, um, I am, it's kind of like a core dump. You know, um, it's a little bit more intelligible than the typical core dump, <laughs> but, um, you know, I'm bringing together fields, uh, answering questions that, you know, I feel with my Substack, it's quite low volume, but um, good luck finding it anywhere else. So I think I have a non-substitutable good, to be candid, and um, what I'm providing is is answers to historical questions using genetics. Yeah, I, one of the ones I read today was uh, was around sort of the Bronze Age civilizations in the, the Han Chinese. I thought that was incredibly mm -hmm. insightful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you. So I'm, I'm actually uh, as we're recording, part two is coming out. Oh, so, okay. Yeah. yeah. So Substack um, enforces a limit on length uh, because um, otherwise Google or Gmail really says it's spam. Okay. And so if you see people doing, I mean, I tend to do this more than other people because I have long essays. Um, you know, I'll split it, part one, part two, sometimes part one, part two, part three, part four, you know, it's 20,000 words. So it's about like 5,000 words per part. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, uh, it's not like you can't figure this out or read about these things elsewhere, but, you know, you'd have to read a scientific paper. You'd have to read like maybe 15 scientific papers. I'm there to kind of reduce it down, give you the gist and the summary. And, uh, you know, luckily for me, I can actually like analyze the data myself. As you see in many of my substacks, I'm actually just doing original data analysis right. to supplement the writing and the historical, uh, you know, essay part. Is is that how you you originally came up with the startup? You just started realizing I need somewhere to put 
all of these mm-hmm, mm-hmm. all of these sort of interesting things. So it was, it was almost necessity that that brought it out. So that's a good question. Um, so the startup. So the way I like to tell people this, uh, <laughs> you know, and and if anyone out there is a is an investor or an angel, you can still reach out. We're still raising, but um, the way I tell them is, you we'll, know, my... we'll talk after I've got uh, okay. I've got some contacts. Okay. <laughs> so um, basically, I have spent the last ten years of my career focusing on the past. Right. So phylogenetics, evolutionary biology, in graduate school I did domestication. I'm passionate about the past. You can take a single whole genome and you create the pedigree and the genealogy of this whole individual. So that means you have a sampling of the species history. Okay. So mm-hmm. when you have one person's genealogy, you have three billion base pairs of those. About six billion of them are variable from the average reference human genome. Uh, so six million, so it's like six million independent variables. So one genome is not just an N of one. It's actually the terminal node in this phylogeny that goes deep into the past. And you can make inferences about the past, right? Right. So that's going to the past. Now, what is generate? Generate is focusing on the data that's going to be generated in the future. Whoa. Okay. And that data will be used to predict your future. Okay. So like say something like precision medicine. Not maybe not specifically your future, but you're young enough, you know. Okay. But you know, like let's say you have kids, okay? Um, you have a whole genome sequence when they're little and it gives them all these outputs. Okay. Mostly they're gonna be healthy, they don't have congenital issues, but it could be like, you know, uh, you have a quite high risk of hypertension. Sure. Um, at some point, like in your 50s, um, that might mean that a low sodium diet is probably good for you. So I'm bringing that up because there is some evidence that the sodium, um, excuse me, I have to call, <coughs> the sodium recommendations that I think, what is it? The U.S. What is the the nutritional the nutritional guidelines? Right. It's it's not a lot. I mean, yeah. every time I eat like a half bag of chips, we're yeah. like, all right, you're at fifty percent. Stop. Yeah. So <laughs> my understanding, there is some work that those recommendations are for about like ten to twenty percent of the population that are highly sensitive. Right. But they don't want to give an average because they want to target the people that are highly likely to get hypertension. Okay. I mean, yeah. So so, and so what I want pr- protect certain certain vulnerable groups. Yes, but. That also means there's a lot of utility. Well, first of all, a lot of people don't follow it. But second of all, there are people who are not at any risk who are avoiding salt. And that's horrible because salt's delicious. Okay. <laughs> um, on the other hand, I have a family history of type 2 diabetes. Okay. And I never order dessert. That's fair. Okay. So I have certain trade-offs. I mean, there's going to be some people that have high risk of hypertension and high risk of type 2 diabetes, and they're just screwed. Okay? Sure. Okay? But I'm trying to say is the genome gives you trade-offs. It gives you your portfolio of risks. And imagine that you had that earlier. Now, a lot of people are not going to take advantage of it, but some people will. Mm. You know? And in fact, like, you know, if you have parents, they might start pushing you in certain ways. If, for example, it's computing that you have a high risk of alcoholism, you know, I don't know. I mean, I don't. So I'm a social drinker. During the, during the pandemic, I didn't drink for a year because I didn't socialize for a year. I mean, I have an MC in my last name, so you can kind of infer where that goes. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to leave it there. <laughs> don't want to get canceled by the green. <laughs> I don't think I don't think most of us get offended by that yeah. stereotype. I think it's it's well embraced. But... OK, well, you know, you know exactly what I'm talking about that. Sure. <laughs> and so. um the point of generate and the point of my passion for genetics for the future is actually to um, allow for human fur- flourishing, allow for choices, to allow for, you know, kind of maximizing your hedonic utility. Okay. Um, also, you know, obviously we're going to target diseases. Um, I'll give um, the viewers and listeners here, um, just this is true. Okay. Um, there's a certain subset of infants of newborns that do not flourish. Okay. And since they cannot give you any information about how they're feeling sure um it's kind of confusing to doctors so one thing that they recently started doing because they could do it they started whole genome sequencing these infants 40 percent of the time they were able to identify something genetic that was causing that problem and is this stopping stuff like sids sudden infant death syndrome (laughs) and various things of this nature ideally all of these um syndromes i don't know the medical but it's a cancer okay cancer has a lot of different causes Mm -hmm. And it ends in cancer. Well, if you can target some of the genetic causes, then you're going to reduce the rate of cancer. So this is why people like Angelina Jolie are getting mastectomies. Now, in the past, it used to be you would look at your family history. But the issue is genes are random. Right. It could be you don't have that risk gene. Maybe you don't need a mastectomy. Wouldn't that be great? You know? Certainly true. I mean, I would say better safe than sorry, but 
that you're, you're talking about in the future when it's like, no, we can be pretty darn safe about uh, to this. To a large extent, we can all, actually, all, for, for the breast cancer genes, those are well studied, for those risk alleles. There's still some that aren't studied. But for example, a lot of the listeners and the viewers are going to know BRCA, BRCA. Okay. Uh, that's really common in Ashkenazi Jews, but it's not. It's, it's you know, it's actually found in Quebecois, and Angelique Jolie's, Jolie's mother is a Quebecois. Okay. Um, so in any case, there's a subset of genes of genetic variants that put you at high risk, and they're they're floating in families. And so before the genetic era, okay, well maybe like all the women will get mastectomies at 40 or 30. Yeah. Okay. Today, you can look for that gene because you know that that's the causal gene. And you can say with 99.99% that you're not at heightened risk. Okay. And so those are the decisions I want people to make. Right. Based, like, action, you know, so I think the term in Silicon Valley is actionable. Like, I don't want to be, like, buzzwordy, but yeah, it is. Data-driven action- and actionable, it's absolutely. Actionable. Yeah. Like, we, it's data. It's information that we now can have. And, uh, you know, at my start of Generate, we want to enable that. So we are, mm. we're B2B, you know, we're kind of intermediaries, we're a platform. Um, we're not one of these precision medicine companies. We want there to be a massive constellation, massive ecosystem of companies that are giving you information, tools, artificial intelligences, like fed by, you know, machine learning and neural networks and all these things. Because we are already swimming in data. And in certain fields like marketing, they know a lot and they can predict a lot. That's true. Which is great to get you to buy their toilet brand. But we can do that with your help. Why aren't we doing it? Um, well, you know, the American medical system is a little. Hip is tough. Yeah, there's um, all sorts of there's yeah. blockages, even like something like electronic medical records. Mm-hmm. You know, they haven't really changed things as much as you would think. I mean, they haven't changed as much as people thought in 2010. I mean, some doctor's offices are pretty efficient, but some of them are still kind of primitive about the data sharing and stuff like that. So, you know, there are human, bureaucratic, cultural contingent barriers. But we're going to get there. We're going to get there. Um, Places like the UK, where they have a socialized medical system, which I'm not a big fan of in general, but they have skin in the game in terms of they actually are motivated to start sequencing people as early as possible Mm -hmm. because they want the people to make decisions that result in, you know, less expense for them sure so like hit the cancer as early as possible if there's going to be a cancer yeah. or modify your your behavior um, so I, I think like right now they're going to sequence there's a project now in the next year to sequence 100,000 newborns in the UK whole genome oh. sequence yeah and they're they're doing actually a new longitudinal study so, the, so, so which is uh, which personally I find both interesting and amazing but of course devil's advocate here how does this not turn into Gattaca well, so, I mean, I think there's a couple of I mean, things. you're familiar with, with the movie, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, okay. a very, it's, a, it's a very utopian, feel-good <laughs> movie from the perspective of a geneticist. No. <laughs> so I think the issue with Gattaca that I would say is um, I'm talking about very specific things that you can predict. A lot of things are quite noisy. Okay. Okay. So you're never going to get out the noisy regi- residual parameter that's due to environmental noise, genetic interactions, et cetera, et cetera. So I don't know. Uh, let's talk about intelligence. OK, um, we Absolutely. know that it's it's heritable and heritability is a proportion of the genetic var- uh, uh, the, the variation in the population that it's due to genes. Uh, we know this like looking at correlations among relatives. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, so correlations among IQs of siblings is like, well, it's like 0. 0.5 or so. Right. It's not it's not a trivial correlation. <clears throat> so the heritability is depending on how you estimate it, because the heritability is a statistics that's dependent on the environmental context. If you're going around um, randomly knocking people in the head with a hammer like a third of the population, the heritability is going to drop uh, because there's an environmental insult. That's true. You know, just to, to be clear for the listener. But in, in modern America, we don't usually have nutritional deficiencies. There are libraries, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so the heritability is going to be somewhat higher, especially in middle to upper middle class environments where there's a lot of enrichment. I think most of your viewers and listeners know that among siblings, there's sometimes a smart one and a dumb one. Okay. That's not random. That's almost certainly partly due to genetics because siblings vary in their genetics. So siblings have an average relatedness of 50%. But there are siblings that are only 35% related and there are siblings that are 65% related. Really? Yes. That Okay. So the standard deviation is 3%. I was going to say, this is shocking because most of us would consider like, well, it's 50-50 from, from mother versus father. But 
It is. So, how it is. It... so what it is is you get 50 from mother and father. Depending on, okay, if you're male, your Y chromosome is much smaller. So if any of you have taken 23 and me, you, you're more related to your mother. That's because they don't standardize some of these. But anyways, let's set that aside. You are correct. It's 50-50. It is deterministic from the parents. But it's not deterministic from the grandparents. So what, what happens uh... is there's recombination in the genome. So the genome, the segments from each parent are swapping. And so you get synthetic segments of your maternal and paternal grandparents. And so I can give you guys, I can give you a concrete example. My daughter is, she is 30% my dad, 20% my mom, and like, was it like 28% her maternal, like my wife's mom. And uh, yeah, and the, and the rest is the dad, right? So um, her, my wife's dad. So you can see, and I can see this with the, uh, with the others. Uh, like my son is, I think. 30%. So it becomes fifty fifty, but it's not necessarily. Well, it's it's almost never that going going a generation up. Yeah. So the standard deviation, the standard deviation in like so when you match the segments, so the expectation is fifty fifty, and that's what we had before the pre genomic era. Right. Okay, but before twenty years, actually, look. Because I was going to say that that stereotype continue, or I don't know if it's a stereotype, but that that sort of perception continues to. Well, it's an expectation, and that's to, what to geneticists had to work with. It actually reduced the power of their methods because they didn't know the real relatedness. They knew it was around 50, but they didn't know that it varied from 50. So what geneticists are look, what are some, what they're doing now today is mm -hmm. actually looking at sibling pairs and how they're related and seeing how that differs in their characteristics. So for example, um, height is quite heritable, like 80 percent, 80 percent of the variations due to you know um, due to genes. Okay, um, and I think the, the correlation between siblings is like 0.7 or 0.6. Anyway, setting that aside. Um, you can do a predictor, so it's a regression model. You can do a predictor. We have a bunch of variables, um, and they're those those are the genes and the weightings of the genes that are plus or negative and all this stuff. Mm -hmm. And it turns out those predictors predict which sibling is taller. Okay, so sibling variation in height, as I think most people would understand, it's not because the parents are feeding one sibling and not the other. It's because they're genetically different. That's for sure. Yes, that's for my okay. my brother and I are a bit different. Yeah. I would argue we, we got roughly the same IQ. He is an inch taller, though. So... Bastard. He, yeah. hit, he, hit, he hit the six <laughs> feet. I'm only 5'11". Anyway. <laughs> and it, yeah, uh, no comment there. No comment there. <laughs> I could get myself in trouble just by making jokes. I'm not going to make any jokes. All good. I'm not going to make any jokes. But um, yeah, so, you know, intelligence is heritable. Um, not as heritable as height, obviously. But the variation among siblings is due to uh, probably genes, actually. Uh, probably it's not that the parents are sending one to private school and public school or something like that. Mm. And so what geneticists are doing now is like getting massive, massive cohorts of siblings. Okay. Because siblings control a lot of the background variables, right? Um, and you could have like, you can, if once we have large enough samples, you could have like natural experiments. Uh, an economist in the audience will understand what's going on. You could have natural experiments where, for example, the parents go through a financial crisis and they pull them out of private school. And so one sibling will have much more years of private school than the other sibling. And then start to compare what the outcomes would be. And if the private schooling is what's predicting mm -hmm. their intelligence or the genes, do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. Like we will be, we will be able to answer many of these you know, late night bull session questions in dorm rooms. Like we are going to remove like so many topics for bull bull sessions hmm. uh, from people if we ch if we choose to do so. Like it, we have the technology. If we choose to do so, we will be able to answer these questions. And and that's what that's what your your, your startup is effectively enabling folks to do. It's one of the things. One I mean, things. you need a lot of you need a lot of data storage, data access, data annotation, uh, data management. I mean, the average. So the human genome. <clears throat> Excuse me. The human genome is three billion base pairs. I think, like, if you reduce it down to just like the spare, like you know, like A C G T, or like do it like you know in some sort of binary, you get three gigabyte gig. Gigabyte. I was, that's what something I was going to ask. Like, what what is a human sequence to look like? Yeah, it, it's about three gig. It's about three gigs, okay. like bare. But you know, you add annotation and other things. That's mm -hmm. also not the raw data. That's the that's the sequence after you pull it out of the raw read. So let me. Let me just get into that. I mean, it's not that difficult to explain. Or do you want me to? Well, actually, it, it sort of leads into something that I was curious okay. about in this in this particular sense, which is we've we've effectively mapped the human genome for whatever that yeah, means. Yeah. But are, does that matter? And the reason I ask that is, aren't proteins sort of the next step, or am I am I overstepping on this one? 
No, no, no. So most of the genome, so most of the genome does not code to protein, but mm. about uh, but a few percent codes directly to protein. Okay. Right. Um, and so that's called the genic. Um, that's called the exome because exons, exons are basically what go directly to the proteins, and um, so the map is important because you need to know. So, for example, okay. When if, we when we say we mapped it, what does this mean? We it's just order. We, we just know the order. We know the order but, of all the but genes. But we don't necessarily we haven't necessarily codified this gene versus that gene. No, but you can't you can't know the the function of the gene until you know its position. Fair, that's fair. Right? Okay. So you need the map to to go anywhere, you need a map. Right. So until we had a map, so before we had the genetic <laughs> I read an article um from 1983 in the New York Times, uh, I think it's called like the human genetic map. It, 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 the word genome wasn't in there. And it was about like whether they could actually even do the genetic map. And it was like, you know, really speculative. They had like, I think like 300 human genes that they knew at the time. Mm -hmm. And they thought, well, you know, there's probably 100,000 to a million human genes. There's 19,000. Exactly. Well, not exactly, but very close to 19,000. Okay. So now we know. Mm -hmm. We know the number. We had no idea what the number was. And we only had 300 of them. 300 human genes after 80 years of human genetics. Right. So we had to have the map. We had to have the map to identify the genes because the genes are ordered uh, physically. Right. So we know yeah. there's, you know, all the 23 chromosomes and all that stuff. So you start chromosome one. It's just big, so it's ordered in size. Chromosome one is huge. I think it's, is it like three it might be like 300. It's like I think it's like 10 percent of the genomes. Chromosome one's big. OK. Yeah. So and then you go to two. And so you start at one end at the telomere. You go. So these are just like physical structures. You start at one end and you keep going. You go to the middle, and then you go to the other end, mm -hmm. and then you do it like so. And it's broken by chromosome, right? Um, and you know which genes are close to which genes that might affect functional interactions. But also the position of the gene allows you to design probes that target part of the genome for diagnostics and all sorts of other things, right? So it allows you to do, if you get a whole genome sequence, a high-quality whole genome sequence, I have one. Uh, most of my family has one now. Mm -hmm. um, you can actually find out new information every single week about yourself. Where does someone go to do this? Is that a 23andMe thing or is that... Yeah, well, I use Prometheus. Prometheus? Yeah. So you just put your raw data into there mm -hmm. and it's like scouring the literature and stuff. Okay. And so what I tell people that have money, uh, you know, this was back when it was like a couple of thousand dollars. And I would tell my tech bro friends like, look, the most expensive and like the least valuable genome is ever going to be is the day you sequence it. Because you only learn more and more. Now, you sure. know, at some point in 2040 or 2050, we're going to hit diminishing returns on a lot of these things, mm -hmm. I'm assuming. But it's still a couple of decades to get more and more information about the genome. Uh, because once the raw information is there, you need to figure things out about it. But you can't figure things out about it until you have it. Right? And so once we have... You know, and genomics has had this issue for a couple of decades now of a numbers problem where the value comes in large numbers and well annotated, basically like phenotypic information attached to genomes and large numbers of them. Well, it's just it was too expensive to have large numbers of genomes. Now it's cheap enough. OK, like imagine like for one hundred dollars a person, you could sequence all of America if you had the sequencing capacity. We don't. But. So, you know. so g give me an example. Like, what, what, what were some of the things you sort of learned in sequencing your your, your genome that you 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 otherwise didn't know? And like, are the, is there is there actionable uh, sure. intelligence there? Or what does what does that look like well, for, for folks um, who haven't done it? Yeah. So I, this is I have some skills that other people do not. So um, I'm not sure. Well, actually, most people in software can do the things I can do because it's basically like you just need to read the documentation. Mm. Uh, they're not really technically that difficult. Um, and you need to learn a little bit of genetics, right? It's just like you need to learn a little bit about the domain. Um, but uh, I'll tell you guys concretely, <coughs> excuse me, um, I have familial hypercholesterolemia. It doesn't show up on any of the markers because I have just a, not a common variant. Okay, This means that it hasn't been discovered in the literature. This is very common, right? There are a lot of diseases where mostly it doesn't turn up in the genetics because they haven't discovered the variant. Okay, um, I'm curious. It's autosomal dominant, which means I have one copy. If I had two copies, I'd be dead. But anyway, um, that means my children, there are three of them, have a 50% probability of carrying it. And you kind of want to know because, you know, with, uh, you know, crest, with basically like all the statins and stuff, you do them early now. You do them in their teens, right? Right. But, you know, you would have to test them and all this stuff. We just want to kind of anticipate if you want to anticipate, right? Um, so when in the genome, 
and I found a mutation in the LDLR, um, basically in, in one of the major genes that affect, because there's many genes actually affect cholesterol, um, but this is the major one, LDLR, I think, which, you know, LDL cholesterol. For sure. You know that? LDLR is like a receptor. Mm hmm so the way the way high cholesterol works is uh, the number of receptors on your cell surface determine the equilibrium concentration. So if you have a mutation on one of the genes, you have like half the receptors or something. It's half. Yeah. So I think it builds up on the outside. Good. I think that's what it is. I'm not as much of a cell biologist as I am a geneticist, but whatever. I that's think I fair. got that right. Um, but in any case, so I can now diagnose like and figure out in my children, which I couldn't before, right? Um, luckily, I don't have too many other issues that I can see. Um, but you know, I've had friends that have discovered things. I, I, I used to tell people you're not gonna discover anything. Like most people don't have any problems, but yeah, like 10% of people discover stuff where it's like, oh, okay. I'm good. I'm glad I know that. This almost seems like medicine basically, but from the <gasps> data driven side with no symptoms as in, Hey, yeah, yeah, you know, no, we, it's, it's pre-diagnostic. Pre, ex, okay. Pre, that's it. That's an even better word. Pre-diagnostic. Yeah, I think I just made that up, but I but like that, it. that is what it I is. Like it. It's like precognition. Like knowing before knowing. Right. Right? And so a lot of a lot of diseases only present. So there's a bioethical conundrum. Like a lot of people in medicine and genetic and bioethics are like, you shouldn't tell kids about stuff that might happen when they're 35. Like that's too much like psychological trauma. I d totally disagree, but your mileage may vary. I'm, that, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a total transparency, maximal information. Anyone out there can type Razib Khan genome or mm -hmm. genotype. You can download my raw reads, my raw sequence. You can also download my 23andMe, my Ancestry, my Family Tree DNA, my National Geographic. Uh, I mean, may, may, maybe this is science fiction, but I'm a I'm a big sci-fi fan. Are you not nervous that someone could, you know, so, someone in some rogue state copies that's you fair. and then you're? Uh, that's fair, but uh, and that's very expensive. They should really hire a hitman. <laughs> Much cheaper, <laughs> it's much quicker. So that's a fair question. And if I was ever going to be president of the United States, that's totally fair. But I wasn't born in the United States. Okay. So I could never so, be president of the United so, States, so I'm good. So I guess we're good then. I mean, you know, or if I ever got as rich as Elon Musk, but um, that's unlikely. And if I got as rich as Elon Musk, I'd have bodyguards and stuff. I don't know. But they might know not to not to bodyguard you when they've they've sort of grown this 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 yeah. doppelganger. You know what? <laughs> I'd be rich enough to become Bubble Con. <laughs> <laughs> All right. The All billionaire right. in a bubble. <laughs> That's fair. That's fair. I like it. Um, so um, wanted to ask a couple of different questions, but the first one is basically kind of diving, because um, we, we discussed some interesting things. I want to get back to you uh, as a person, though. Why, why genetics? You seem like a very intelligent person. Obviously, we've been having a good conversation. You probably could have gone into computer science. You could have gone into mathematics, chemistry, all sorts of you know, really interesting fields. Um, what? Why genetics? Why? Why? Why yeah. is this? Why? Why? Why did this really, you know, float um, your boat? Well, um, so I did go into chemistry a little bit. I was a biochemistry major. That's in the biochemistry department. And my dad's right. a chemist. Right. And uh, my brother's a physicist. A lot of my uncles are engineers. Uh, my other brother majored in math. Uh, so, you know, mostly, most people in my family that do STEM do do more physical science, I would say. My grandfather, my maternal grandfather was a doctor, so that's technically life science. But, you know, that's a little different. <coughs> um, so, uh, in terms of my skill set, yeah, maybe. Um, so, I didn't want to do, say, neuroscience or organic chemistry, which I took. Uh, I'm actually pretty good at memorization, but I think that's really dull. Hmm. Um, so, genetics is a branch of biology. Uh, that requires less memorization. Uh, it's actually kind of a branch of, you know, like, so population genetics, what I do a lot of the time, um, that's basically um, deduction from a particular model, Heidi Weinberg equilibrium P squared plus, you know, uh, plus Q squared equals, you know, people know that, right? Sure. Um, and so you have a model, you look at the outcomes of the model, you test, you know, so it's basically, um, it's algebra for biology. Um, pop, the quantitative genetics, which is another field, which is kind of related to heritability, what we were talking about earlier, that's actually a branch of applied statistics. And statistics came out of understanding quantitative genetics. They used to call it biometry, you know, mm. the biometricians. So, um, you know, Carl Pearson of the Pearson's correlation coefficient uh, was, you know, quantitative geneticist, really. Um, and obviously, he contributed a lot to statistics. Uh, R.A. Fisher, uh, he's a theoretical population geneticist, as well as a statistician. Uh, if you did ANOVA, you know, and a lot of like the frequentist models, right? So um, that's the kind of, so it's kind of like a quantitative, formal way. 
And you get, you know, um, the cognitive psychologist Pascal Boyer says theory is information for free. So with population genetics, you have information for free. You can look at the world. You can decompose things. You can try to predict things, right? And that's not really like if I studied some sort of molecular mechanism, I don't know, like a super important mechanism like the dystrophin gene, which is the biggest gene in our genome and is responsible for a lot of muscle diseases, is super important. Um, but I couldn't wander around the world and kind of draw inferences, right? right? So, and I'd have to memorize a lot of things and visualize all these molecular mechanisms, which I'm okay at, but um, anyway, I, it, it doesn't do it for me. Uh, in terms of the other things like computer science, um, you know, that's a really interesting question because, uh, you know, I do do programming. I just like learn programming at the end of college. Uh, mm. Mostly I started with Perl scripting. I apologize to everyone out there. Um, and, you know, now I'm. Perl was the glue of the Internet in the 90s. It for was. I know. Ever, forever, I, know how to, so. I know how to do write CGI scripts, people. <laughs> I think there are CGI scripts somewhere on some websites that I wrote. Um, but in any case, um, you know, now I do Python. I had a Java phase and. You know, I used to read. Uh, you know, I used to read Ivar Horton's Java books, and I read some like Lisp and Schema books. So I'm sure. into that, you know. Um, but, you know, I really like history and humans. So I'm a people nerd. I'm very extroverted, um, and I've always been interested in history. Actually, um, since I was about 12, uh, I was interested in STEM since I was about like six or seven. Um, like I have very like precise periodization mm -hmm. of my interests. And um, these two have been parallel for a long time. And then in 1998, um, I got a copy of a book called History and Geography of Genes by L.L. L. Cavalli Forza, probably the most eminent human population geneticist of the 20th century. This was his magnum opus, his culmination of his life's work. He used about 100 genetic markers to infer the population history of the world. Wow. <laughs> Which I didn't understand was doable um, because, you know, I was studying biochemistry at the time. I did not add the biology major until later. And uh, I was I was fascinated. I was like, this is what I want to do, you know? Well, I, actually, I'm going to be honest. I didn't know that I would ever do anything like that. And I kind of thought, how do I say this? I kind of thought this is too interesting to actually ever make a career out of, you know? Um, and I always liked population genetics, but I didn't, like, really get how it applied to anything. And so, you know, I worked as a web developer, a database programmer and stuff in the 2000s for a while. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, just like kind of bounced around, but I kept going back to genetics and as computational biology and computational genetics came to the fore, I was like, okay, this, this is for me. Um, you know, like working with a pipette, like I've done it, you know, you know, I've like done PCRs and all these other than Western blots and all these blots. Okay. Mm -hmm. Like I don't, not very skilled at it, but I've done it. I know how that's worked. That's where a biology is not, I'm not skilled with my hands. Okay. I don't have gold hands, you know, um, and, but I'm skilled at thinking. Uh, but I'm also like not super interested in just being purely a theoretical biologist. Yeah. So I like massive amounts of empirical data. And so L.L. Cavalli has spent 50 years collecting about 100 markers on 2,000 individuals. Okay, It was a 50-year career. started in like 1950. He actually lived until, was it 2018? But he retired in the mid-2000s. He uh, actually developed Alzheimer's so or dementia. So he wasn't active after about like 2010 mm -hmm. as a scientist, you know, but it's like 60 years career. Right. Um, and he published uh, uh, history and geography of human genes in 95. It was like after about like 45 years. Um, so it was a coalition of all his data. So on my computer, on my P uh, MacBook Pro, um, I have many, many data sets where I have about like 600,000 markers per individual mm -hmm. as opposed to 100 genes. <laughs> and I think I have like just um, just not in the, not in the cluster or anything like that. I think I have like thirty or forty thousand individuals. How do you obtain those? Are you are you sort of reaching out to various companies? Are you asking individual people? I still don't. Okay. I just made that up. No. That's awesome. <laughs> I <didn't> Where? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I mean, a good high story. There, let's there, let's do a, this. There is a lot of um. <laughs> there is a lot of public data that's open. I have consulted for companies, and basically, um, a license that I worked out with them is like I never share the data, sure. but I can analyze it. You know, I mean, it's anonymous, you know, I can analyze it myself for myself so I can use it for my own training sets, mm -hmm. but I can't share it. Right. Um, so there's data. So I have they're in different folders. So I have like public data mm -hmm. and then I have data where it's like, uh, oh, these are like private things from consultancies. And then there are people like uh, I have big Internet presence and I solicit. I've probably gotten like 500 
uh, samples from individuals, uh, mostly of like rare I mean, ethnic groups. People just spit in a cup, or like how they does have it... raw twenty. There are millions of people that have like raw genotype data. They can send it to me. So if I want to answer a question, oh, they just export from a site that they've already done it with or something. Yep, yep. Okay. And so I look for people that are from like rare ethnic groups that aren't in the open data data sets for some mm-hmm. reason. I mean, it's it's not necessary really now, but ten years ago. I was one of the few that was just reanalyzing things from groups that have not been sampled, yeah. and I was just getting it from the private companies because they weren't doing the analysis themselves because they had other priorities like making money, you know. Sure. So yeah, I have all of these data. So I have the way I've set it on my Substack is I can do like I can run a principal component analysis in a minute on thousands of individuals across hundreds of thousands of markers, mm-hmm. and that's orders of magnitude more analysis than Cavalli Forza could do in 45 years right? at I, a university. I imagine this is sort of where that, because again, another thing I read in your sub stack is where, where sort of that, that Madagascar mm-hmm. um, stuff came from, where it was like, hey, this is actually not as African as you think. It's actually where Africa meets Asia type yeah, of deal. Yeah, well, so there were a lot of conjectures that people had. So people knew, so let, let's, so I have a sub stack piece on Madagascar, that's the context, you know, right. for the listener or the viewer. Um, you can Google it, Razib Madagascar sub stack, right? Just like <laughs> that'll work. Um, but in any case, so, you know, Jesuits, like, uh, you know, I think they were Jesuits, um, you know, Catholic missionaries, um, had gone to Madagascar and they had noticed. They usually go everywhere, so that's yeah. not, even if that's well, they, not well, right, okay, it's probably so, the, the key is that, a high percentage The key is that's that true. these were people from, these were Jesuits from Malacca. Okay. Okay. So they knew Malay. Hmm. So they went to Madagascar, I think in the 17th century, because there were Muslim traders and stuff on the coast, you know? And they were just, whoa, these people speak something very close to Malay. Really? Yes. I actually speak something very close to Malay, but that's a different topic. Oh, do you really? I lived in Indonesia for four years. So oh, okay. I speak so do you know a, Javanese? Uh, or Bahasa Indonesian? Bahasa. Yeah. So actually, uh, you read? did you read the Madagascar piece? <laughs> I, yeah. Did you know where, do you know where the Malagasy are from? This is not a pop quiz, but. The, uh, well, they would have been, uh, they would have been Borneo, no? Yeah. They're from the Burrito River Valley in southern Borneo. Yeah. So they're literally, like, this isn't Although like, that's called Borneo there, it's... Uh, Kalimantan, if I recall correctly, for okay. Indonesians. Okay, so, so yeah. Kalimantan, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, the island of Borneo. Yes. Kalimantan province, right? So basically, it turns out that the Malagasy languages, they're like languages from this south, this is it like the southeastern area of Borneo, right? Across from Java. Mm-hmm. So it's not like they're Malay, it's not like they're Javanese or Sundanese, you know, or they're Batak. They're like a very, very specific like C Dayak related language. So what's up with that? Because they're they're off the coast of Mozambique. Exactly. Okay. So we knew that. We knew that. And if you look at the people, especially Highlanders, um, like the Marina people, um, I think the Betticello. Anyway, um, so if you look at the Highlanders, a lot of them look kind of Asian. Some of them look totally Asian. If you actually look at the president of Madagascar and his wife, they look Southeast Asian. Really? Yeah. I, totally I mean, something. I haven't. I, I don't. I don't think I've seen Madagascar people before. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So they do. I mean, just Google like Mal- Madagascar people, and you see some people that look totally Af- sub-Saharan African, mm-hmm. some people that look totally Asian, and most people kind of look in the be- in between. Wow. And so we kind of knew that this was what was going on. <clears throat> so what, what did genetics do? What does genetics add? There's a couple of things. First, um, you can look at the segments of DNA and look at the segments that match all across the world. And this is just relatedness, right? So you and your brother are about 50% related. You and your cousin have like, uh, you know, like 6% or whatever, right? Et cetera, in theory. But, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but there's variance there, you know? But right. in any case, um, so you can use these relatedness distributions to figure out what population you are sampled from, right? And if you're like half Chinese, half English, you're going to get two results, obviously. Right. Sure. Um, so what they did with the Malagasy genome is you can look at segments that are Asian and segments that are African. Pull out the African ones, leave the Asian ones, and then run the relatedness statistic. And it turns out they are related to people from Southeast Borneo. So wow. the linguistics is totally correct. They are Southeast Borneans. Um, also, a lot of their cultural practices, their religions, it's some sort of... They have. They don't seem to have that much influence from Hinduism or Buddhism, and definitely not Islam. Hmm. So this was a long time ago. Um, Hinduism and Buddhism came to Java and that area like two thousand years ago, but it obviously didn't penetrate much of Indonesia for a long time. And then, I mean, Islam didn't penetrate much of Indonesia for a long time either. True. So it's just a big. It's like the size of the United States, even though it's mostly water, and there's a lot of isolated areas that are just not 
touched. And it looks like the ancestors of the Malagasy come from, you know, I don't want to say more barbaric, but less exposed to outside influences. I'm sure of that. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so we now know that from genetics, but there's another thing going on. <clears throat> there are large regions of the genome of Malagasy people that are much more African. Okay. Right? And so what's up with that? Like really strong selection, adaptation. And it's all due to endemic diseases to Africa. Ex ex explain like that. Malaria. Help me out. Okay. Like, there's a type of malaria that Africans are much more resistant to because um, it's called the Duffy allele. I guess it's on chromosome one. And basically, um, you know, most of your listeners know most genetic variation is within people or within groups and not between groups. Right. But this is not always true. Okay. So, you know, you say 15 for continental races, stylized fact, but it's kind of true. 15% of the variation is between races and 85% is within races. Okay. So that means when you look at like allele frequencies, they're kind of different, but you got to look at a lot of them to figure out to, they're easily separable, but you need to look at many, many loci, right? Mm -hmm. You need to get many variables, accumulate their results, and then you can separate people. But at some loci, they're totally disjoint, which means that all of the variation is between races. So one of these is the Duffy allele locus. Is uh, that just a sexual selection characteristic that no. occurred there? It's, it's malaria. Okay. It's extremely strong selection for malaria, and I think, I think this is a null allele, kind of like what I have for uh, cholesterol, where they don't have the receptor. No mm. receptor, pathogens can't get into the cell. And so this is an allele where in sub-Saharan Africa, it's very close to 100%. Um, this null allele, and outside of Africa, it's very rare. And so, it, you know, in the pre-modern era, before genomics, they would look at this position, and this was a diagnosis for African ancestry. Mm -hmm. Okay, in people, because if you saw the Duffy allele, it's like, oh, what's going on there, right? Um, in 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 the Malagasy people, um, so Malagasy are about like, uh, it varies. Highlanders are more Asian, Lowlanders are less Asian, but let's say about like forty percent Asian, forty to forty five percent East Asian. Okay, right. The Duffy allele is like way above that. So what's happening is the Malagasy's have a subject selected to massive natural selection because they arrived in an ecology that was similar enough. So they're old because it's tropical and the highlands of Madagascar, rice, rice paddy agriculture works, right? So if you look at them, they look like Southeast Asia. But there's all sorts of malaria. I mean, Southeast Asia has malaria too, but they're different. They have all sorts of malaria and endemic diseases there. Now, these diseases are probably brought by Bantu from the mainland. So it does look like the Malagasy are the ones that pioneered um, the settlement of Madagascar, probably like 580 or so. Wow. Um, but once they did... The Bantu followed them. Um, so one hypothesis is, oh, they brought slaves. I don't necessarily think this is true because a lot of the paternal lineages are Bantu. And usually when you have, you know, like social status imbalance, it's usually the women that are assimilated. And so mm. in this case, it doesn't seem like that at all. So, you know, either they're matrilineal, which could be true, like they assimilated Bantu men into their villages, or, you know, it's not the simple slave story, you know? <clears throat> but in any case, these Africans came, they brought um, cattle, they brought their pastoralist lifestyle to the lowlands, mm -hmm. and all sorts of diseases came with them because they're people. They bring their diseases, and the diseases like work in Madagascar. The local fauna, even though it's exotic, I guess you know it can incubate some of it. You know, maybe some of the birds, especially. Um, so you have a situation where these Asians are mixing with Africans, and there's all these African diseases. So what the African diseases are doing is sweeping through the genomes in areas where the Asians are vulnerable, mm. and nixing it out. Right? So it's a perfect illustration of the theory of adaptation through natural selection occurring through genomic variation in the last thousand years. It's actually like one of the strongest. I think until recently it was the strongest example of selection, and now we know another one, and that is lactase persistence in Europeans. Uh, milk digestion ability. Oh, I was going to say, basically people could eat cheese in, in, yeah, yeah, yeah. in it's, Europe. It's, it's much more recent than people thought. Really? Uh, yeah, like I'm, last... I absolutely adore cheese, so yeah, this is wow. a big, big deal for Thank me. Thank evolution. Thank Charles Darwin. <laughs> no. So it, it looks like it's been happening actually the last 2,000 years. A little earlier in England, nobody knows why. Um, it used to be think, thought like, oh, it was like four, five, six, seven. It was like with the Neolithic maybe. No, no, it's really recent. So nobody really knows why. Um, there's some model building of like, oh, like certain types of famines. And so lactose is a third of the calories in milk. Sure. So if you can't access it, you get two thirds as much calories, which, you know, we probably like want that, right? You know? <laughs> I mean, especially, I mean, especially then, but even beyond that, I mean, you've got, it's so tasty. 
Well, I mean, it's it, so tasty. Well, milk it has a slightly sugary taste, right? I don't drink much milk, but I mean, it has a sugary. I'm not a big milk drinker these days. Yeah. I was when I was growing up, but like, I mean, che- cheese is my jam. I'm yeah. just gonna tell you. You mentioned that you don't you don't necessarily eat dessert very often. My dessert is always a big fat cheese plate, Wait, are you from which Wisconsin? may actually be be worse. Wait, are you from Wisconsin? Originally St. Louis, Missouri. Cheese is just a thing that I've just loved forever. Yeah, you're you're a spiritual Wisconsinite. <laughs> Fine. <laughs> to be honest with you, I'm more of a French cheese guy, but you know Wisconsin. Well, yeah, those Wisconsin's have more lactose. Not bad either. Mo- those have more lactose. Well, they're softer. They're runnier. I was gonna say even beyond that, I actually like. <coughs> French cheese from France, specifically because it's not pasteurized. Okay, what's, what's your what's your favorite French cheese? Probably a Camembert. Nice. So this guy's sophisticated. <laughs> <laughs> cheese snob here. Maybe, maybe a little Lapoise, but yeah. uh, Camembert. Camembert. I, 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 I mean, take I know it. Camembert. Those are nice. Those are nice they're, cheeses. They're there. pretty phenomenal. Yeah. Um. Well, I. We we can't talk about genetics, right? Without at some point talking about CRISPR. Oh yeah. Where has this gone? I used to hear about this thing all the time. Can, can we kind of start from like yeah. the base? Like what, what is CRISPR? Yeah. And then fr- from that matter, like where has it gone? Like, right, I'm not. It, it a, was, it I'm was... not a molecular biologist. So I might make some technical errors here, but like basically, um, CRISPR is a way for bacteria to actually like I think defend themselves against viruses and stuff, right? And that so, sounds right. Yeah, and so it's been in nature for a while. And then in 2012, um, I think Jennifer Doudna, Carpentier, those are two primary ones, Doudna and Carpentier, but there's some others that came on later. Mm-hmm. Basically, they figured, oh, well, we can like use this. And so you can use it to cut, and then you can also use like other, you know, uh, other technologies to like put things into the cut. So you can use it to cut out and delete, but you can also use it to put things in. And it just turns out, um, so technically, uh, it's just really easy. It makes it cheap, and it's much more accurate. Um, so there were other technologies called talons and various times of recombinant DNA technologies. They were extremely expensive and um, tedious, and only huge corporations ever did it. So the reason CRISPR is important is this sort of like bacterial um, genetic engineering technology is accessible to, I mean, almost anyone. So there's a guy in Austin, Joe Zaner. Or, he's not binary. She's okay. They're they, not. They, yeah, whatever. so Joe Zayner. I, I, okay, so. Used to be Josiah, okay? Anyway, so Joe Zayner. This person. Yeah. There we go. Easy but like, enough. They do, they do a lot of CRISPR like biohacking themselves. Like they have CRISPR kits. There's just some, not some random person, but, you know, a biohacker. There's people that do that. Um, so, I mean, I'm not going to like out anyone. Actually, I think he's talked about. But anyway, people that we know in Austin, they go to other countries and they get crispr Okay. So why can't I be an X Man? Because I mean that's that's where I want to go with this. Yeah, I mean, I think right now the main thing is um, off target effects, which is like errors. Hmm. So if you do CRISPR on animals or plants, not a big deal. It's going to transform genetic engineering and GMOs, right? Really quickly. The issue with humans is okay, like it's still ten years in; they're still perfecting it. So what's going to happen in the next next like let's say before twenty thirty? They are now working on um, crispering out uh, and crispering in, um, uh, you know, putting in, inserting good good genes for uh, cystic fibrosis. We know the genes for that. Amazing. And ALS. Those are the two I know. And now, they just did malaria. Now. Uh, sickle cell. Now, th- 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 uh, this, is, this is unbelievable, but, but theoretically, you could effectively inject someone with this. It will recombine their DNA and then they what yeah. they don't have ALS anymore yeah yeah so as in like Hawking would be fine yeah well, yeah, if yeah, was yeah yeah so some, this, something so that's nature I have an acquaintance whose daughter was born with cystic fibrosis like yes. three years ago and I told him straight up because he's really stressed I told him straight up like bro your daughter's gonna live she's never gonna be a marathon runner but she's probably gonna live like normal lifespan and so what's gonna happen is in the near future they are going to have treatments where I think it'll I mean, it might be a spray delivery. I don't know how they're going to deliver. I mean, I haven't looked at Well, I mean, it's in trials. In any case, um, they're doing it in dogs and stuff too because mm-hmm. the dogs are like big enough. Their organs are large enough size. And um, they will rescue function. It, you need to rescue function in some of the tissue. Yes. Once you rescue function in like 10 to 20%, whatever, you're just going to be able to survive. You're never going to be able to be a runner or do strenuous exercise. Sure. But you're going to survive. You're not going to die at 45. Okay? That's a that's a good start. Same thing it's with pretty a- great start. ALS, I don't know as much about, but um, I know they're doing it in dogs. 
And basically, I mean, again, you're never going to be a lifter, but you probably are going to be able to survive and walk around. Which is, I mean, that's a massive, obscenely massive yeah. improvement. So right. I, I think that in these sorts of congenital defects, diseases, um, CRISPR will transform our lives in the next 10 to 20 years. Not you and me, but, but a what, lot of people out there. But that's what I'm saying. Let's go 50 years out. I yeah. mean, can I... Can I grow wings? Can I control metal with my mind? Like again, where where where, where can I X Man myself and make myself, you know, Wolverine or something? Yeah, In I mean, instant I thought it was healing inter factor. Interesting what we... that you touched your chest area because, like, they could, there were certain things that that can be done there. <laughs> no, no, I'm good the way I am. I'm just more along the lines of like thinking about like rapid healing and all these goofball things that I okay. I'm, so I'm what you're talking about is like about. gain of function, and yes. that is ethically more fraught. I don't really think it's that big of a deal if you want to take a risk as an adult, so it'll happen probably in the Persian Gulf, China, somewhere. Not the United States, probably. Yeah. Um, but so gain of function. So there are people who have a genetic mutation that allows them to be very functional on four hours of sleep. I've heard about this. Yes, and it's a real thing. I think there's probably side effects that we don't know about, but mm. whatever. There's going to be people who want that <laughs> as adults. I think Da Vinci did that, something like that. Yeah, um, but I've I've heard of people for very a disproportionate number of very productive people are like this because they just have more hours, right? Because like they have more hours to do stuff because like you have to like go to the bathroom, eat, blah blah blah. Well, they still have more hours left over, so I think people are going to get that. But when you say gain of function, that's that's one thing. I mean, could you end up doing? Co correct me here if I'm wrong, but if I recall correctly, there's. If you have a double copy of this one gene, and I can't remember what it is, if you have a double copy, you're immune to AIDS, but not HIV. Yeah, you... I think a Delta, yeah, Delta CCR. And then if you have a triple copy, apparently you are literally immune. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. like you so can't I, catch HIV or AIDS or whatever. Yeah, that was the one Ho Jean Kui, um, Ho Jean Kui, uh, you know, uh, did genetic engineering, you know, CRISPR on the, I think the babies, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. And then in that case, you're, I mean, that disease is, you're, you are literally immune to that disease. Yeah, that's a receptor issue. Is yeah. that a, okay, so that's, a, it, it, now would we consider that to be gain of function or is that just yeah, well, a receptor Well, okay, no, thing? it's loss of function. Okay. It's loss of function because it, it's removing. So I have a loss of function. That's a loss of function. Because you can't, because the receptors are, are blocked yeah, off you're breaking now. a gene. I understand. Right? So gain of function is a mutation where some, gain of function mutations are often really bad, by the way. Okay. Because you produce like messed up proteins and the messed up proteins bind with other proteins and start like interfering with multiple pathways. When you have a loss of function, you just remove a protein. Okay. okay? So gain of function sounds like a good pathway to cancer. That's, I mean, this is, there's been like off target effects that cause cancer uh, with CRISPR. But in any case, let's like set that aside. Okay. Let's assume that there's no off target effects. Um, gain of function would be that function that I mentioned. Uh, I don't know the genetic pathway. It could be a loss of function, actually, uh, genetically. But there's other things, like um, there was a little kid named Little Hercules um, that they thought that the parents were like giving him steroids. Yeah, he's yeah. German. His parents were professional athletes. So there's a mutation that like roids up, like not literally roids, but they're just hypermuscular. I think they do have issues with heart disease, and, and, like heart attacks, mm -hmm. because whatever. But anyway... Um, so normal people, there are like a non-trivial number of athletes that have one copy, but it's really, really low frequency in the population. It's very rare for people to have two copies. Very, very rare. This kid's parents were both professional athletes in Germany and they both had a copy and they came together in him. So he was a jacked out little kid. Right. There could be people that are like, I want to be jacked out. I mean, maybe I'll have a heart attack when I'm 50, but I'll be, I mean, people take steroids. Lots of them. Yeah. So, I mean, this is a gain of function that I can imagine. Now, in the future, you want to go full Gattaca. Um, and this is like legit, like positive Gattaca, not just like discrimination Gattaca. Sure. Um, you know, intelligence is about like 50, probably more really genomically heritable. Um, you can imagine. So it's like a lot of, but like a third of your genome has some sort of intelligence relationship. So you'd have to go in there and change everything, right? But if you want to do it, maybe sometime in the future, everyone, every, every man a genius, you know? So sp speaking of, for that matter, if we if we just focus on the binary track of, of men and women, I guess the question would be, would this disproportionately affect men versus women? The only reason I ask is, even though we all cluster around the mean of 100 IQ points, it turns out that there's a lot more men at the extreme low and at the extreme top. Like it's sort of it's disproportionate, mm -hmm. whereas women, the, the sort of gradient at 100 is is notably higher than the men because we're a little bit more peanut butter smushed, which is why we we, you know, we, yeah, it could. I think um, so the male female genetic difference is just the why. 
So we have one copy of the X, they have two copies, and then we have the Y, which has like a few genes that do things. Most of the genes that do things on the Y relate to sperm. Okay. Okay. But we don't know everything. And there's interactions, blah, 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 right? If we target it early, yeah, I mean, maybe there could, you know, there probably be like the same effects, like more retard. More mentally disabled, I'll just say the R word. That's all right. Uh, maybe edit that we out. We kind of grew up with that, but that, I mean, nowadays people. I'm Gen X, okay? That's I'm the sorry. thing. We, that wasn't like a bad thing. Yeah. That was what the, they, the, those folks I were mean, called. I mean, I call my friend Dan and F and all yeah, the time. Yeah, it happens, but the truth of the matter is, you're right. It's It should be mentally disabled, which yeah. is, it's, it's a better so term. So there's going to be more females that might be like that as well as maybe, I mean, if, if this is true. And like, mm -hmm. I think I, I generally believe the variance hypothesis as an empirical fact. I mean, I, I think it's hard to disagree with, um, but. Um, there's different arguments for why, you know, about the sex chromosomes or whatever, or just uh, in development. Um, if the develop, if it, if it, <coughs> if it, um, if the process, the development process, is very early on life, uh, you can't necessarily change things, right? So some of these things I'm talking about, like cystic fibrosis, what you're really doing is, um, as the, what you're really doing is modifying a small amount of the tissue, and then those cells reproduce themselves, right? Right, and so you gain the function. Now, when you're thinking something like intelligence, it's not a tissue. It's an incredibly complex trait that emerges out of many, many developmental processes. And some of them probably shut off around puberty or at a very young age. That's what I was going to ask. Isn't this more of an, uh, sort of an emergent property as opposed to like a flip on or off switch type of deal? Yeah, I mean, it, intelligence is basically like the, the normal distribution of intelligence, like law of large numbers and all these things, is basically the sum of like, you know, tens of thousands of variables. You know, thousands of variables, technically, if you want to talk about just gene count. Right. I think it's like a third of the genome or something ha can be can be can be like assumed to be some sort of predictor. Right. Um, so that doesn't mean that's just like causal. Like there's all sorts of details. But basically, it's highly polygenic. There's no IQ gene. Right. right. There is one IQ gene, but there are IQ genes. But those are ones that make you mentally disabled. So like if you have like, a, you know, copy on chromosome is it 22. 21, sorry. <laughs> uh, 21, right? Uh, uh, I think trisomy, yeah, trisomy 21. So it's not Down syndrome. Right, right? that's, that's so the Down syndrome. Yeah, so there's like things you can do to like kind of like drop everything. But I mean, here's something. Um, I told this story, so it's, it's a fun story. A friend of mine was doing work in cognitive genomics, and there was a subset of his population that he saw. This wasn't part, it published because it was like outside the purview of the paper. Subset of the population that were predicted to be mentally disabled but had average IQs. And so it was really curious about what was going on here. They had parent information. The parents all had super high IQs. Hmm. So they were mentally disabled according to their expectation. So if your expected IQ is like 125 and the mutation drops at 20 or 30, you just go down to average. That's fair. If you're an average, I mean, if you're not a, fair for them, but yeah. But if you're an average person, then you really, you know what I'm saying? Sure. And so the issue here is like he, he realized, oh, there's a small minority of people who have these mutations that say that they should be mentally disabled, but they're actually just normal, and their parents are probably thinking, what is wrong with you? Because their parents are probably professors or lawyers or doctors, and they are quite likely working at Whole Foods as a manager or something. Hopefully, you know. I I know one or two people like this. Yeah. It and it's just, you know, like either, so what What you would say is like, oh, they're lazy. You know, you're going to, you're going to attribute it to their character in some way. Like a flaw in their character. Because they have the parental raw material. They look like the parents. And, you know, the parents and their grandparents and their cousins are all successful professionals. But they're missing sort of. They're missing something essential. No one, no, no one knows. No, no one, one knows to check because they have average intelligence, mm -hmm. you know. Because according to the population norm, they do. You're not going to target kids until they hit around 70. That's that's the threshold, you know. That's the threshold right. that you can murder someone, and you're not going to get executed. I had no idea that was the case. Yeah, if you're, you're if you're mentally disabled, you cannot get the death. It's cruel and unusual punishment. I mean, I think a lot of people argue that no matter what your IQ is, but I get where you're going. Yeah, no, um, but, yeah, but no, that's literally that's literally. Uh, <laughs> so this is a little. Stephen Pinker talked about in the blank state twenty years ago. This is a situation where every person in prison for murder is trying to argue that they're mentally disabled. I mean, if you actually look at the male population in prison, they are pretty low. I mean, it's yeah, a lot of them qualify. There is a reason that the prisons are filled with men and yeah. and, and 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 uh, high and, time and, preference. Yeah. 
like low, you know, rationality. Ration- I mean, the, I mean, when you look at certain crimes, I think one reason, I mean, I think it is evil, but one reason that people think it's evil and demonic is it's also so irrational and cruel. The combination of irrationality and cruelty. So, I mean, I mean, if you're, I don't know, a McKinsey consultant, maybe you're doing consultant, consulting for Libya on how to, you know, um, run their prisons effectively. That is kind of cruel, but you're making a lot of money, and no one's gonna ever get, no one's ever gonna call you out on that. You're also generating nonsense for a living, but whatever. I'm just saying, There's a bit of a bias there. I'm, yeah, no, that's fair. Like, I mean, I think most of it's BS too. But no one's gonna, no one's gonna put you in prison, true. and you're gonna make a lot of money. That's true. So you can rationalize that as like, okay, like it's cruel or it's stupid, but. There, it, there's a rational reason to go through this song and dance. But, you know, some yeah. of the crimes, it's just like, what? It's like totally nonsensical, you know? But we don't put ourselves in the minds of those without minds. That's a really good point. I'm just saying. They can't think that far ahead. And like, they, they, they don't have the, they literally don't have the actual tools to think the way that I, a, a regular person I mean, okay, would. I'll give you guys a concrete example. I just saw this recently. Like, this was like in the news. Guy goes, uh, I think he robbed like $50. And the clerk was like, take the money, sits down, turns his head. The guy looks around. And there's all on video. He jumps behind the counter. He takes the gun. He blows the back of his brains out. I think I saw that. Yeah. That's some crazy stuff. And then he went to his parents' house. We're just chilling out there. Yeah, I see. I don't understand how you couldn't argue diminished capacity in yeah. that scenario. If that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, yeah. It's it's just. I mean, like if you do something like that, you on the run. Well, a regular person would be. <laughs> but he's just like chilling. Um, yeah. wasn't me. You're on video. Oh. You do understand these stores have video camera. He was actually looking around and he couldn't find the video camera. And he decided like, I, cause like you could see, actually see him looking around and he couldn't find it. So he concluded it, I guess it didn't exist. And he decided to kill the clerk. Wow. You know, again, this is, this is the need for that startup to come up quick and fast. So we can sort of map these things and maybe, maybe turn on some genes for a couple of people. Yeah. And so I, you know, I, I do want to like, you know, on a positive note, you know, there's a geneticist here, behavior geneticist, Paige Harden in UT Austin. She wrote a book uh, called the genetic lottery. It got a lot of criticism from kind of the communist left because they're, you know, no, nothing's irrationalist, but, and I have some disagreements. I'm not a liberal. I'm not like super liberal. So whatever. Um, I didn't agree with some of, cause she, her audience are liberals. And, but she was arguing from the science. Like, we do have a lot of science that executive function is highly heritable, uh, that intelligence is moderately heritable, yeah. um, that, you know, there are things that run through families across many generations that are behavioral, you know? No, no question that's autism. Aut- do you know how, how heritable autism and schizophrenia are? Give me a number between um, zero and one. I wouldn't, I mean, what, 0.25 maybe? Yeah, that's that's a good that's a good that's a good value for more normal behavioral things. It's point eight. What? Yeah, that's yeah. high. That's yeah. really high. It is really high. But if you've known of people with schizophrenia in the family, you know that it's in the family, and the same with autism. That doesn't mean it's like inevitable. Even if the heritability is high, the correlation between parent and offspring can be like point five, which like you know if you do an R squared, whatever. Uh, any, anyway, it's, it, I don't want to get into it because it depends on how you model the trait. But in any case, my point here, though, is now with genetics, with the tools we have, we can potentially actually predict um, which of your children are highly likely to be schizophrenic or autistic. Or if you want to do pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, do screens and right. only implant embryos that don't have those risk alleles that you are carrying. Yeah, that's. I, I actually know someone who did something similar to this. She... Uh, she didn't have it, but both of her brothers actually have like a macular degeneration mm-hmm. thing. They're both. I, I, it's very common. They're both incredibly like they can't drive cars. They're incredibly visually impaired. Yeah, it's common. And they're only in their thirties or whatever. And then what ended up happening was she was like, "I'm going to pass this on." Uh, it turns out that she ended up getting. I, I don't. I don't know the full process, but you, you get your eggs cleaned or whatever it is, and now she's she's got a kid. He's doing great. He has no signs of it or anything like That's that. True. So it's it's amazing. Science it's amazing for a better world, do. people. That's the idea anyway. So you mentioned a word earlier uh, called telomeres. Mm -hmm. There has been some really Mm -hmm. notable things that have happened in just the past year or two. 
so I haven't actually like I have like the, you're talking about the anti aging and senescence and stuff. Yeah. Like, like, give me an update because like the telomere stuff has been around for like thirty years, and um, telomeres are super important. I mean, these structures exist for a reason. So is it turns? Okay, I'll, I'll give yeah. you like again the you know the the, the, the general week. public nonsense yeah. version, which again I have no background in this, but. The idea was that that um, these telomeres, basically the length determines effectively what your actual age is, not, you know, random revolutions around the sun on the earth. And so as these things shorten, right, they end up basically not producing... Uh, pr- yeah, over the, over, over the replications. Right, o- over X number of replications, yeah, tons yeah. of replications, I guess. You know, you, you end up being... Uh, you know, they, they end up with errors and various things of this nature. Apparently, there's some Israeli science going on where you can you can extend these through various various ways, mm. and they've actually gotten it to the point where they grew them about 25. percent And I believe the treatment was pretty simple. Mm-hmm. It was like um, hyperbaric chambers, mm. high oxygen yeah. content, et cetera, et cetera. I, mean, I heard about some, something of this nature. Again, you know, you look this up. Don't don't take my word for sure, it. Sure, sure. So of this I, I think nature. I've heard about this. Um, I will say, like, I didn't look deeply into it, but People were saying, like, be really skeptical. Um, so, like, a lot of the anti-aging stuff, the anti-senescent stuff, um, there's a group of biologists that are just like, um, I mean, I'm going to start up, all right? So I know, you know, and I come out of academia, I know how scientists think, and I know how startup people think. I know how discoverers think and how innovators think. Sure. Let's just put it that way. And... Um, you know, most science is failure. Most experiments fail. Okay, but I have to be honest, the people that stay in academic science are kind of risk averse in some ways. And um, that's fair. Most people <laughs> most people don't take jobs where if they if they had any, you know, if they have any 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 tolerance for risk. They don't usually take jobs where they effectively cannot get fired tenure yeah. and whatnot. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, that's that's, so, that's so, the right thing for some people. But this goes to issues within science and how discovery and knowledge is generated and they have a lot really strong status quo bias right Mm. um i mean we could have discovered crispr back in the 1980s because it's been known in bacteria for a while but people never thought of applying it in a more general context right Mm. so why not well i mean you know these things aren't always easy but part of it is um orthodoxies do get stuck. so I think the best case about unfortunately about this is that Alzheimer's research with mice and plaques and it turns out that some of the canonical research I think in like 2008 is I mean is allegedly fraud I'll say allegedly I mean I've I've heard about that like yeah. some of the stuff that we base like quite a, quite a, a, lot of our a large understanding yeah, yeah, and yeah. funding on the field is, yeah. is BS and like a lot of it isn't even fra- a lot of this stuff isn't even fraudulent but like you know there's cancer labs where basically there's pedigrees and there's lab groups and there's coalitions and they'll block everyone out of funding so the way the granting system works is you have experts that sit on particular panels for particular topics well if you know what the experts think and you want to get a grant from them are you going to tell them that what they have devoted 30 years of their lives to is wrong? That's a that's a that's a tough thing to Yeah. to to get out there. I mean, ideally what would happen is there should be a majority view and then people that are working on minority views, but the issue is like nobody wants to not get that grant. Everybody wants to get the grant for their lab, you know, cuz they have people that they employ, you know? It's like humans. Um so there's this problem and it's to various degrees in science. Um, so I think the startup world <coughs> doesn't have as much of this problem. Like, it has this problem in terms of like, oh, like, you know, crypto is going to transform the world. So there are there's group think there, you know. Definite group think in, yeah. the, in the crypto world, no question. I'm just using that example because it's one that people know now. You know, this is not the first time it's happened. It's not going to be the last time it happens, yeah. right? But the point is um, you have people that come out of nowhere that think, that they are gonna transform something, and most of the times they don't, but some of the times they do. That's the key, right? Um, so you know, like, so let's let's talk about Theranos, which everyone every everyone knows about. Um, it was fraudulent, blah blah blah, all this stuff, right? But she probably started out. I mean, she started out sincere, and she still believed in it. I I mean I I think there was actual real like. <laughs> I think she was putting too much pressure on, on to be honest with you, sort of the tech and the mechanical expertise yes. that yes. she didn't really understand. Yes. I don't think she literally went in there and was like, all right, I'm just going to like bilk no, a bunch no, no, of people no, no, out no. of money. There's no. no way. And so basically, I think yeah. the underlying impulse there is still good. Like sometimes even PhDs 
that are at the top of their field are wrong. True. Okay? Most of the time they're not actually, and most of the time the startups are going to fail. But my point is you still need to let people experiment on the margins of the heterodox. And this is why I'm coming back to aging. Okay? Uh, there's a lot of money that goes into anti-aging research because of self-interest reasons because Peter Thiel wants to live forever. You know, because he's running out of blood, boys. I mean, this like with the labor support. No, I'm just joking. I love Peter, by the way. I love Peter. I love hope. And this is a joke. Peter, this is a joke. Uh, I'm serious. Like, I do love Peter. And I, I know a lot of Peter. I, I know Peter a little. Anyway, um, but I mean, I'm joking. But the whole point is there's a lot of money in anti-aging because people with money want to live longer just like anyone else. OK, yeah. but it's not an easy problem to solve. And there's lots of different ways people are trying it. And so I'm okay with hearing about these kooky things. I mean, so do you remember, um, I mean, you remember uh, ulcers when we were kids were due to stress. Yeah. Um, but I mean, they're not. I, first of all, I, th I thought that was like the only cause of them. That's yeah. what people thought. Thought I will say, um, ra randomly, slightly off topic, I apologize, but they... It was one of the most common causes of surgery in the 60s, and then what was it, 80s or 90s, literally it was like, no, no surgery almost ever, you pop a pill. I thought that was a pretty pretty great leap forward that we yeah. made there, yeah, so just I mean, on a positive but note. But my point is, like, there was there were people who thought, like, I think there was a Greek doctor who thought it was H. pylori decades ago. Really? Yes, and he could not get, because everyone knew. By the way, do you know that um, that shutting down borders does not prevent pandemics from spreading? We do know. <laughs> also, did you know? Did you know that um, masks don't work because these sorts of things are not aerosolized? I think they admitted that finally. Yeah, I'm just, I, th I think I'm, they said the N95s are pretty good to go, but everything else is. But my, 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 but my point is, they they dragged their foot on aerosolization, even though the Japanese knew almost immediately. Right. So the Japanese had a model of aerosolization in February 2020. And our CDC took, I think, a year and a half. I mean, it's interesting if you're if you're talking about COVID. One of the most interesting things that I, I I felt was that people don't talk about anymore is, if I recall correctly, March or April, the Brits actually came out with a plan. They were like, "We're not going to do anything. Yeah, we're not going to shut our borders. We're not going to yeah. do anything." And they basically got shouted down on the entire world stage. Well, they were going to go full Sweden. Yeah, they were like, "No, we're just going to let it run through because this is what it has to has to happen." And they effectively got shouted down by the entire world. It was the first time I've ever seen a nation canceled. It was pretty wild. Yeah, so I mean, um, and just so, just so the listeners and viewers know, I um, I was an early COVID hawk. Um, I you know partly because my my wife knows some Chinese. She's not Chinese herself, but in any case, um, we were tracking on Instagram like in mid January, mm -hmm. and <clears throat> I was just doing back of the envelope numbers, and I'm like, unless the Chinese are biologically different, <laughs> it's coming here. And so for the month of February, I was the crazy guy. I like apparently I talked about it a lot and I know that I talked about it a lot because I got a lot of appreciative texts around March 10th of people who were like, well, Razeem sounds crazy, but maybe we should stock up and prepare. <laughs> like I literally I was like, wait, I talked about that. And I was like, I must have been insane because this is how I felt. This is how I felt. I felt I'm a biologist. Most of my friends are bio. A lot of them are biologists, but they're not stressed and they're talking about going to conferences. What do they know that I don't know? Okay, this is, I was feeling insane. Like, you know, and like, this is like known, like, oh, T.A. Frank wrote about me in Vanity Fair along with another bunch of other co early mm -hmm. COVID hawks, you know? Mm -hmm. But I mean, my point is like, I was there early and then like all these paper people later joined on and, you know, then they're saying like, oh, well, we should, uh, not to get political, but we should like go to the BLM marches because it's more important. You know, all the people that were saying, oh, it's going to be like the flu. You know, I'm mean, saying people change their the consensus updated multiple times. So one sure. thing that the coronavirus pandemic did teach me is like, I just don't, I'm not going to listen to public health people because they have no new information. I mean, there's some things we know about germ theory and stuff like that, but they're basically like group thinkers. So you're not going to get much signal out of them. But going back to something you earlier said, is that kind of like the salt content um, warning labels in the sense of they're just trying to apply this to like the the, the you know the most reduction. vulnerable people? Yeah, harm reduction, which is true. I mean, that's a fair thing. So sometimes you need to think like an economist, um, which uh, Tyler Cowen and Alex Tabarek and George Mason, um, you know, they had these fast grants and other ideas. And I remember all my scientist friends were like, they need to stay in their own lane. And it turned out that their fast grants were, were great. Like they discovered like various things and they made they made a difference on the margin. But, you know, all my scientist friends were like, let the help, public health people do their job. I'm like, you know, why, why does it hurt to have like 
attack this from multiple directions. Exactly. Right? Yeah. And so that's what that, this is. We got here because you brought up the hyperbaric chamber and stuff like that. Sure. Yeah, it's probably it's probably it's probably not true. OK, honestly, it's probably not true if I had to bet. But if it is true, that's a big deal. And we should hope it's true. OK, so when it comes to health stuff, we should let people be audacious on the margin so long as it doesn't hurt people. Yeah. Right. So, I mean, I, you know, there are certain things that people are doing or I have think, done. I, I mean, not again, not to get political where you were going, but like, I think that is some of the issue that the public health folks have is, well, you just gave the caveat of not to hurt people. What's the definition of that phrase? Because yeah. are you talking pure physicality? Because maybe maybe we need to extend that a little further. I, again, I'm not I'm not them, but. Well, I mean, so the public health issue is a little different, partly because we breathe the same air. Right. Right. Where as opposed to like Steve Jobs did a lot of like new age and diet stuff for his cancer that probably there is some there is some belief that if he had intervened aggressively with regular medication, met one regular chemo, mm -hmm. he might have knocked it out for a while and still be with us, you know, but he would want to do this diet stuff for whatever. Um, and so but that's his choice. It is. He's I Steve mean, Jobs. Yeah, absolutely. It doesn't spread to other people. So, you know, I um. Okay, so I mean, like, I will get political. Like, I'm not myself very liberal, but I sometimes say things about vaccinations or COVID, and like, you know, all these conservative people are like, you know, I'll, they use the R word. Let's just say this: they're like, you're stupid. You don't think, you know. And I'm just like, look, I'm like, you know, I've had conservative friends like laugh at me. They're like, oh, you believe in vaccination? And I'm like, okay, like, this is this is well, really I mean, stupid. You know, when 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 polio was eradicated. It's pretty hard to argue that Jonas Salk and vaccinations uh, don't work. Yeah, so so anti vaccine it's, it's different yeah. when we talk about yeah. you know potentially you know new, and new, of vax, new vaccines. But, yeah, but, yeah, I mean, so there are arguments. So I, I would tell you guys, and I've told this story before, so I can tell it. And he's gone, anyways. My best friend um, from middle school, um, he moved away in high school, so that's why I say that's good from middle school. Um, when I in the in like 2007 or 2008, everyone was getting on Facebook. Uh, I was like, when is Dan getting on Facebook? And he just wasn't getting on Facebook, and so we talked. I talked to a mutual of my of Dan, Dan and mine, Tom, and he was like, "Oh, did you? Uh, so did you ever hear about what happened to Dan?" And I was like, "No," because like I moved away and I was in California at the time. Whatever. Mm -hmm. um, I'm from Oregon, right? Um, turned out Dan uh, went to join the Marines when he was 19, and um, he had to take a bunch of vaccines, and he died of a massive uh, like some sort of he brain hemorrhage due to a reaction to the anthrax vaccine. Wow. And this happens That's every terrible. year, but you're going to have to take the anthrax vaccine if you want to join the Marine, right? So stuff does, I'm not denying that, okay? You should, people, the issue is, the issue is like some scientists, they want to deny that because it's so rare, but the issue is like we have social media today now. The cases where it does happen are going to be elevated. I mean, again, as you just mentioned, you know, there's, there's, there's not one genome. There's infinite genomes, well, yes. eight billion individual yes, ones. It's like yes. you don't know how yours is going to react to a, to a given thing. Yeah, and also, you know, um, today there's a lot, of, there's a lot of stuff now about, um, you know, as we're recording, um, about the Pfizer vaccine and and how it was pushed through really early without the usual checks and stuff like that, and you know, the complaints are coming from conservatives, quote unquote, right. We're the side that wants less regulation. And I mean, that's how I remember this a couple of years ago. And when Trump did, you know, that whole warp speed, the people who were worried, who were complaining were the Democrats and the liberals. And now it's like all flipped. And it's just like, do we want regulation or not? Do we want safetyism or not? I was going to say, in this country, I think the I think pharma's gotten it from both sides at this point. Yeah, yeah. Which depending is, on, on, on which, what I mean, year we're talking. They made a lot of money. They make a lot of money. So, you know, they can take it. My only, but my point here, though, is like, um, it's just interesting to see my conservative friends just kind of flip. And I'm not here de denying all of their objections to mandates or to, eight, you know, like, should a 25-year-old healthy man actually take this? OK. Oh, it turns out that the vaccine doesn't prevent infection. It just prevents mortality, you know, or morbidity, you know, these sorts of things. Uh, yeah. I think some of these objections are real and these correction and like the authorities, the powers that be should not have lied. You know, like some of them, they just admitted to lying about certain things like masks because of shortages and stuff like that. But when you lie because the means justify the ends, they're not going to ever trust you. And so the trust is gone in a lot of segments, you know. Um, and um, that it is how it is. Um, but that doesn't mean that there's no objective truth, that there's no science, that there's not going to be innovation. You know, I don't want to be totally, totally negative here. But um, 
we are we are kind of in a situation in our society where there's a lot of polarization. And it's mm-hmm. causing some problems with our ability to see clearly, you know? And I, to me, it's like I have views about various things, but the most important thing in the world for me is to see clearly, right? And it's not, I mean, other people, it's for other people, it's music or family. Sure. I have a family, it's, it's super important to me. But, <laughs> you know, just like from like as a kid to now, seeing the world clearly is the number one thing. Mm-hmm. Not seeing the world how I want to see it. Seeing the world how it is. Well, you're, I mean, you and I are both Gen X, so I would agree with you, but I'm just, I'm not, I don't know. I'm not sure other people feel that way. Millennials don't. Zoomers don't. Some of them feel that they're. Because they they live in cyberspace. Sure. Because they're feel. So, I mean, this is, I mean, I was actually arguing with a friend of mine about this. But the truth of the matter is, we're going to have to adapt to them, not the other way around. Well, I mean, they might have to like adapt to the world. Depends on how you look at it. They're changing it. They're literally changing things as things move forward. And you know what? (laughs) Just like with jeans, some's going to be good, some's going to be crap. Sure, sure, but you know, the, the, the United States, uh, the United States could uh, ignore science education until Sputnik. Yeah, all right. There are other there are other countries and other cultures out there that have different attitudes. You know, I can tell you, a lot of people in other parts of the world are like, "You guys are insane! Like, what's going on?" I'm like, "Well, we're rich, we're happy, we do whatever we want. We're the most powerful country in the world. What are you going to do about it? <laughs> we'll see. You know, nothing is forever." You know, China's going through some difficulties right now, and we're going through a bearish phase about China after a bullish phase. I think both were overdone. Um, they still have 1.35 billion people. Um, they still have an incredible amount of human capital. Um, all of the stories about all the AI that's being done in China have disappeared because people are bearish on China right now. Do you think that they stopped working on AI? They definitely did not. No. So chat GPT is out there. Okay. But what is like, you know, chat Confucius like? You never know. Yeah. So, I mean, my only point is like, I think I agree with you about Americans and I'm mildly pessimistic. It is what it is. But um, we kind of take for granted that we're number one. We're world reserve currency. We're the most powerful military. We're the most innovative because of San Francisco and a few other tech hubs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But eventually all empires hit their limits, hit their end where they've run through their human capital. Um, I mean, do you, um, I mean, like, I don't know, like you've hired young people. Lots. And like, I mean, do you think, um, okay, I, I'll tell you, like, I'm not gonna, pre- I'm gonna tell you what I think. I think um, sometime around the year 2000, something happened. I think it was No Child Left Behind, if I had to pick, um, where they were teaching to the test for a while. And uh, these p- kids are like of fine intelligence, but they know nothing. Like they don't know a lot of basic facts about the world. And my hypothesis is that they stopped teaching facts and they taught skills. The skills often were geared towards passing certain standardized tests, right? And this is Goodhart's principle where, you know, when you make a measure explicit, it starts stops me- measuring the underlying thing. I would tend to agree with a lot of what you're saying, to be honest with you. I'm not sure if all the variables uh, 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 necessarily add up exactly, but basically you what you end up doing is you have to basically look at, you know, varying teachers unions, et cetera, and understand one of two things, right? One of them is what's working. And the secondary thing is what's not working. And of course the, what's not working a lot of times they're misaligned incentives. Mm -hmm. So, well, I mean, I have little kids. I mean, do you have kids? No. That you know of, but, um, genetics will answer this, (laughs) (laughs) but, uh, you know, um, what I told my, my liberal friends is like all the scare stories on Fox news, they're totally true, and I know that because it happened to my kids. So I don't really care what you tell me about what you heard on MSNBC or the New York Times. Right. It happened to my kids, so I don't care, right? Right. So it's like I'm, I'm not, I'm not gonna disbelieve my lying eyes or whatever, right? Um, so I, you know, I, I'm just saying this for effect. I don't want to get into it, but um, in terms of the future, I am worried about um, America's kids and America's youth because they're not connected to reality. So we talked about history earlier. Mm-hmm. They don't know any history, okay? So I'll give you a concrete example. I mean, that, that's proven to be dangerous on a, both a country, an individual, on almost every level. We will level repeat. When, we exactly. shall repeat. Exactly. Um, so a friend of mine who will probably be a faculty in genetics, um, he's from, you know, went to a good school, went good lab, quantitative mind. Uh, he has an undergraduate social science degree. So he's more multidisciplinary than most people. And he was talking about um, <coughs> how, you know, the Republican court, I mean, he's, he's moderately liberal. The Republican court is legislating from the bench and how this is super scary and stuff like that. And like, you know, this is like unprecedented. And I was like, well, what about the Warren court? And he's like, what's that? Yeah, he didn't know Justice Earl Warren. You're just like, how did he not know? This is a really very smart person. This is a top 1% American. He's, prof- he's going to be a professor. 
at at a top research one university, surely, judging by a publication record. Well, people always, they, uh, anytime I say stuff like this, especially to the younger generation, a lot of times they're like, well, you're old. And I'm like, not that old. Almost every person I talk about was born like 50, 60 years prior to, to my birth. So how do you not know them is, is my question. Well, I mean, you know, like let's talk about like, say, like racism, which like Americans are obsessed with today. And, you know, I'm just like, do you, they're like, America's like fundamentally white supremacy. And it was, it was kind of founded, you know, 1790 Citizenship Act, limited naturalization to white people, right? But do, do most people know that we had a Native American vice president in the 1920s? Wait, I didn't know that. Yeah. Did we? Yeah, Curtis. I, wow. 1920s, early, th he was Hoover's, I believe. So That's awesome. 28 to 32. He was three eighths Native American. He grew up on the res. You did not know that. I genuinely Because America is a white supremacist that. country in the 1920s. So you did not know that. You did not know that Richard Mentor Johnson, the vice president, between 30, 1836 and 1840, was in a common law marriage with a mis mixed race, like, you know, black, white, mixed race woman and had children with her. And he was the he was a candidate of the racist party then, which was the Democrats. The Democrats were the racist party. I mean, they're both racist, but I'm only bringing these things up because the past is more complicated than people think. And we have we definitely do do we, too much. Everybody. But the current generation they have a children's cartoon version of history. Yeah. And I am very- It's definitely a bit too reductive. I'm very passionate about the details because the details, like history is like theory, it's a theory poor field. Like Peter Turchin and Cleo Dynamics are trying to add more theory. It's a theory poor field. You need to know the facts. You need to know the details. Mm -hmm. You can't go by theory because your theory is wrong. All theories are wrong, right? You need to know the facts to see what has happened as an empirical distribution because we don't know, we don't have like a generative model. You know, mm. can't generate that that pattern yet. Maybe someday we could. We could create a theory, but we don't have it now. And so you need to know the facts. You need to know the history. You know, like when For you sure. say, like when you say, like you know, white supremacist has been the cause of of everything. You do understand that the ancient Greeks didn't didn't view themselves as white people. They viewed themselves as civilized people. Like they didn't even think like us. Like they knew that people in Ethiopia had dark skin and curly hair. The people in India had dark skin and straight hair. They classified everybody and they knew there were different races and they thought the different races had different temperaments, okay? But their taxonomy was not our taxonomy. They viewed the world fundamentally different than us. So when you take your own understanding of history, your own understanding of America after mm -hmm. 1965, mm -hmm. and you expand it to all of human experience, that is just an intellectual abomination. I mean, I, I, regardless of any of this, I, I would advocate that, at least for most people, one of the most beneficial things they could do is spend at least a year or two living overseas in Amen. somewhere else. I agree. Because the mentalities are extraordinarily yeah. different between the countries. I've lived in England. I lived in Indonesia. Um, I spent a, a, a pretty good amount of time in Colombia. So, like, you know, pretty, pretty, a, a pretty decent smattering of places. And, wow, very different mentalities, very different things, very different just about everything. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, that's, I mean, if you don't want to read a book, experience another culture. <laughs> that's going to give you, that's going to give you a different history. Or that's going to give you a terminal, because well, it's what I was talking about, about genetics. Like one individual is the terminus of a genealogical history. Right. An individual culturally is the terminus of a society's history to some extent. You're sampling from part of the distribution, mm -hmm. but you get a totally different view. Um, and you get like totally different questions and totally different starting points that you would never think about. So with, I don't mean to keep going back again to your startup, but like, you know, these thoughts are sort of permeating my head. And, and one of them is, is, is this, are we effectively talking about like genetic archeology span in, in some way, shape sure. or form? Sure. I mean, we are, we are excavating the genealogy of the human race. I do talk in terms of populations, but populations are just clustered genealogies. Right. So, for example, um, there's something there's a project called uh, Descent from Antiquity. So the genealogy of the European nobility, you can trace it back to about the Merovingians, back to about the 600s. Mm -hmm. uh, so the 7th century. And that's the folks that came after out of, Rome. Right. At, like sort of out of Israel and Rome and whatnot and then and, or, or whatever you want to call that area and then sort of moved into into France. Correct. You're correct. You okay. are correct. So they're actually they're from approximately they're from Western Germany. They're France. Oh, OK. Yeah, Francia, Franconia. Got it. All right. So that's what the Frank that's so Franconia and France have the same root. It's from the Franks. And so the Franks occupied like I'm not sure France and Germany would like to hear that, but Um <laughs> I well, think they're okay Char today. So Charlemagne Charlemagne, I, I this is what I read. His native language was actually uh was a Germanic dialect. It wasn't German because German's from Hessian. Anyway, but um 
but it was a Germanic dialect. It was like Franconian, more like Dutch or Franconian. And, but he could speak. Uh, he could speak the Roman language, like you know, vulgar Latin. He could speak it. Um, it was the late. It was like his his grand. I think it was his sons or his grandsons where the division started happening between people in you know Francia that only spoke the Roman language and people in Germania, you know, the German areas that only spoke the Germanic dialects. Anyway, mm. um, but uh, so in terms of genetics and genetic archaeology. There's this project looking at genealogies, and they haven't been able to really establish a definitive um, descent from someone in classical the classical times. Because within the classical times, there are genealogies. Like there are descendants of the Julio Claudians that you can trace into the early 500s. But then the sixth century is a total disaster. Ju Julio Claudians meaning uh, like Augustus, 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 Caesar, Augustus, Augustus and Tiberius. Okay. So the Claudians, the, Tiberius was a Claudian, mm -hmm. um, and then Augustus was obviously a Julian. Well, well he was adopted by Caesar. But in any case, um, the two families that are married, so they're called Julio Claudians. So Nero was the last Julio Claudian. <laughs> and he was descended on his paternal lineage, I think, from the Claudians. Speaking and, of missing some genes or something. Yeah. Man. But there were other there were yeah. other branches that weren't I mean, most of the times like the, these elite it's like a high stakes winner takes all game. And yeah. they often tend to kill like the other branches, but some of them managed to survive and they persisted down, you know, in the records. Um, we don't know if they're real lineages. Sometimes people make shit up. Mm -hmm. But um in any case, so they persisted, but then there's like a huge break during the Gothic Wars. Uh, under Justinian and stuff in like the post-Roman period when the Roman Empire went in the West collapsed and all this stuff. Right. And so there's a breakage in the lineages and they reformed these barbaric Germanic warlords. So, you know, um, the lineage of the current House of Windsor, which was saxe coburg Gotha, but I think through the maternal lineage, you can... What? When I was at Cambridge, they hated it when I brought up the original name of the Windsors because it was just like you know you're you're under Germans, right? Sorry wow. to any Brits. Well, listening. I mean English English is a Germanic language. True. But even True. on the but even on the um, the, the um, on the lineage that goes back to Alfred the Great and to the House of Wessex, Alfred mm -hmm. the Great, even though he was Christian, he he traces his descent from Woden, right? Mm -hmm. And so um, they these aren't going back to classical the classical world. They're not descended from the Roman elites. And so I'm only bringing this up because with genetic genealogy, right. you will be able to trace people to antiquity. And there is one case that we now know. Um, it hasn't been extensively publicized, but people know about it. And it's of a famous person because the famous people's genomes are public and um, ancient genomes are public. So you compare famous people to ancient genomes and you can find a perfect match. So the Y chromosome lineage passed from father to son directly over 2,000 years. There was one, I believe it was found in Rome. It seems to be of a Syrian individual. And this individual seems to have a descendant that's alive today. Whoa. His name is Nassim Nicholas Taleb. Really? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, Nassim's quite proud of it, I think. But uh, in any case, he's not going to be the only one. Um, as more and more ancient DNA comes, comes, you know. But he's effectively got a genealogy dating 2,000 years. Yeah, back to, there, was a, there was a Roman Syrian, like literally in Rome. I think mm -hmm. the samples are from Rome. So this is a Syrian that lived in Rome. There were a lot of Syrians that lived in Italy, actually, for a while, you know. A lot of the early popes, like in the... Eighth century were Syrian. In any case, um, uh, so it was Roman Syrian, and like somehow his genealogy, you know, that seemed to love. There's a lot of people that we will match over time, and so we will solve descent from antiquity that way. We'll eventually probably have like descent from the Bronze Age, you know. But uh, well, so like, uh, concretely, like my Y chromosome lineage is is called R1A. Mm -hmm. It's very common in the Indian subcontinent, Iran, Central Asia, and in Eastern Europe. So fifty percent of fifty to like seventy percent, I think, of men in Poland have an R1A lineage. But the Slavic lineage separated from the Asian lineage about four thousand five hundred years ago. Uh, Yes, I think 4,500 years ago. Mm -hmm. And so when I meet a Polish guy, I'm just like, yeah, like we had the literally, we literally had the same forefather sometime in the Bronze Age. Wow. And one of his sons went east, and one of his sons kind of stayed in that area. And we can trace it with ancient DNA. I've written about it. Wow. We can like look at the ancient, we can look at them moving, these Indo Iranians, we can see them moving from Belarusia to Central Russia to the Urals. To Central Asia, and then eventually they show up in Iran and India. That's incredible. Well, I mean, it's really cold in the Ural, so I don't blame them. <laughs> Still, it's just amazing what you're able to do with, with again, with with this modern day technology, and that we're able to move yeah. move in these directions and trace. Again, like you know, it, it's interesting because we we, we sort of covered medicines and 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 um, you know preventative care, et cetera. But it's also again can be used as like. Uh, history marker and 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 uh, archaeology. Well, and it, it there's is, a number is, of fields. It is our family tree, and like you know, it is it is the. You think we'll ever get back to Adam for some definition of of Adam? Well, um, Y chromosomal Adam, it has. 
I mean, we know that he lived, I think, like 150,000 years ago, somewhere in Africa, obviously. Sure. Uh, there's actually okay, so there's an, there's so Y chromosome lineages have letters like so I'm R one A, and so they're like this huge phylogeny, and like half of them are in Africa, and then half of them are in Africa, not Africa, because we're subsampled from Africans. Okay. Right, and so the non-Africans are sub mixed with some some of the Africans, Northeast Africans mostly. We say that, but like, is, does this count the populations that are we, we we know that have been like millions of years out of Africa? So, for uh, no. instance, like the the the, we, we, the we, Australian Aborigines, etc. No, no, they're, they're, they're the same. They're non-African. They're from. Okay, so I'm gonna. Can I can I just ex expose it? Please, really please, okay. yeah. Okay, so because we know this now. Like 20 years ago, it was kind of like vague, but we know this now from Homo genomes. Like we know the truth. The truth is out there and we have it, okay? So this is what we know. It looks like modern humans with um, like our flat faces, high foreheads, mm -hmm. tiny chins, mm -hmm. that are like a little bit jutty, you know? That phenotype, that morphological characteristics evolved somewhere probably in Africa uh, three to 400,000 years ago. Um, multiple different populations might have been ancestral. It's kind of complicated. Probably in Northeast Africa, but not sure. But it's probably in Africa, okay? We don't have enough ancient DNA to confirm for sure. But... Um, in a, a bunch of them stayed in Africa and kind of, you know, diversified in the Khoisan, Bushmen, West Africans and East Africans. There's a lot of mixing, a lot of things going on. But let's like take the story now to, you know, well, mine and your ancestors because we're not African. OK, to my knowledge, you're not. Right? I'm not. Yeah. Well, I mean, think you don't, you're not. Uh, 23 and me says like almost down the board like half non non specific Celt and the other half German. It's 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 very generic. Okay, okay. Well, no, maybe it's you, know, you think it's generic, but it's generic because you you think it's generic. I mean, a lot of people think, oh, that's interesting, you know. But anyway, um, you get like German beers and Guinness. Um, yep. Maybe I shouldn't have said that, it's, but whatever. It's, it's not even a joke. But, I do. <laughs> but um, but so what what we know just looking at the genomes, everybody outside of Africa, from Andaman Islanders to Australian Aborigines to Swedes to Chinese to Native Americans. Uh, to Arabs, all of our ancestry goes back literally to like a point 60,000 years ago. And then there's like a long bottleneck, like we were on an island. It might have been like, um, it might have been like a, a delta, like on the edge of the Sahara and everything, everyone else died. But we were separated from other Africans somewhere, maybe in the Middle East, maybe in North Africa. But we were separated for like 10, 20,000 years. And so that's why when you look at a genotype, like if you look at the 23andMe PCA and stuff like that, Africans are separated from non-Africans. It's because there was like this long period of separation and isolation. And there was like on average, like around 1,000 people. So we might have come close to extinction a couple of times, but we didn't go extinct. But we were isolated and separated for thousands of years. Thousands, like maybe 10,000. Even when we say 10,000, how would you get all the way down to, to, to Australia? It's really far from it anything. Is, is, I'll, I'll get to it. I'll get okay, to it. Okay. okay. <laughs> so we know for a fact that there's these non-Africans, right? Um, and they look like the Africans physically. They don't look like Neanderthals. They don't look like Denisovans, who separated from our genomes like seven, like about like 800, 900,000 years ago. They're an earlier wave outside of Africa. They're cousins to each other. They split like 600, 500,000 years ago, east-west. Mm -hmm. Denisovans east of Mongolia, Neanderthals west of Mongolia, Neanderthals in the north, Denisovans from... Southeast Asia, all the way up into Mongolia, okay? Um, so these are human populations that were around. And then our ancestors, who are these African, non-Africans, call them Neo-Africans, they're isolated, they're weird, they're genetically kind of inbred. We go through a bottleneck. Like, mm -hmm. our, the signature is quite clear, okay? Like, there's no structure in this population. It's just this homogenous population of people, like a tribe, and it's moving outward 55,000 years ago, and we know this from ancient DNA. It's quite clear now. It's 55,000 years ago they absorb some Neanderthals. I've seen that where you, where you can sort of tell what yeah, percentage... Every non-African has... Some Neanderthal yeah, DNA. Has, it has some Neanderthal. And so we absorb some Neanderthals. Perhaps we were a coalition of tribes that absorbed a single Neanderthal tribe or perhaps like they were badasses and they were evil and they like killed the dudes. And, you know, I don't, I don't know. We don't know, okay? But they in, they, they interbred or they made it. I would say, because they're human. I think I call them human. They, we, they made it, not interbred, uh, with these Neanderthals. Okay, they mixed and then they just kept going, okay? Then like 50,000 years ago, um, people that went east into Iran and then into South Asia and then into East Asia and to mm -hmm. Australia started mixing with the Denisovans. Okay, 50,000 years ago, you start to see signatures of Denisha than admixture, okay? By at the latest 45,000 years ago, probably a little earlier, you start to see um, humans and massive megafaunal extinctions in Australia. 
Really? So modern humans show up within 5,000 years of the of showing up in maybe South Asia. I'm wondering how they even got to that island. It's really far. It is, but there's there's two things. One, um, one is during the Ice Age, uh, Southeast Asia was actually called Sundaland, and so the area south of Thailand, north of Borneo, Kalimantan, Sarawak, right. actually Sarawak and Sabah, as, and Thailand, you know, like that, what is, what is it called, the Gulf of Thailand? Yeah. The Gulf of Thailand was land, it was a savanna. Okay. Okay. So it was. So there, the, there's a little land bridge there. Yeah, and there was, it, some of it went east, but um, it didn't. It didn't cross like the, the straits between like I think like Lombok and Java were still. They're deep, right? So Wallachia is this transitionary zone. Actually, Bali's in between the two, but yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I think it's Bali and Java. Okay. I think that's what it is. And then Sulawesi was separate. Yep. Right. And then you go east. Papua was connected by like a flat kind of probably like low savanna or maybe wetland to Australia. And that's called Sahu. Really? Yeah. So it was a little narrower, but they had to cross. Okay. Probably what they crossed in some sort of like boat. The issue is like we don't those don't preserve. Because Papuans look notably different than They do. Like like just just pure appearances. They look notably different yeah. than a, a standard but they got their, Indonesian yeah. or, or Malay. They did. And they all diverged like forty five to fifty thousand years ago. Right. Okay, and then they didn't intermix too much. Papuans have multiple Denisovan admixtures in them. It looks like so multiple Denis. So Denisovans were really separated from each other. There's one type of Neanderthal. There's like four or five types of Denisovans to the okay. point where like Denisovans are more different. Like the northern Denisovans are more different than the southern Denisovans. Probably than me and you are from the Khoisan Bushmen. Wow. Yeah. So there was a lot of Denisovan racial diversity, and these Denisovans got mixed into the ver at various levels. In China, it's like 0.15%. In India, it's like 0.2%. In Papua, it's like 5%. Okay. Okay? All right. I've got two questions, okay. one short, one long. All right. Short one is, um, I want to make sure we, we, we cover this. We kind of covered this with your sub stack, et cetera, but I want to know where people can find you online. Mm -hmm. So obviously, Razib Khan... Razib Khan Substack. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you've got a Twitter, et cetera. Do you want to you want to sort of give those out yeah, before so I the ask the? Yeah, the first place is Razib.com. Has a link to everything. Nice. I bought it in 2005 because I thought maybe someday I'd be able to like say it. I've got <laughs> DavidMcKay.com, so I'm with yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. I also have RazibKhan.com, but it points to Razib.com. Um, so I have a Twitter. That's Razib Khan at Razib Khan. Um, I tweet there. Um, some of my tweets are pretty spicy and mean. So <laughs> just like f fair warning there. Razib.substack.com. I have a blog called Gene Expression, GeneXP.com. I contribute to a blog, blog called Brown Pundits, brownpundits.com. My company is Generate, generate.com. So G E N R A I T.com. Um, I also contribute to Unheard, unheard.com, mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Sometimes National Review. Like, so I write for various places. Um, I, I don't have the bandwidth right now to write for too many. Um, and I haven't, but you know, you can see all the links and all the archives. Um, and also, um, Razib.com has an aggregator blog. Uh, if you just go backslash WordPress, and that all my content that's RSS feedable is actually fed into that. Excellent. Right. Outstanding. Now, if you could manifest, and yes, I'm using that word, deal okay, with it. Okay. If you could manifest a technology into existence, you can't say teleportation, it's too easy. But if you could manifest something into existence, mm. theoretically something to do with your field, what what would what would that be? What would you want to what would you want to see out there? I mean, okay, this I don't want this actually to happen because it doesn't make any sense and it's incoherent. But I love a time machine. Okay. But I mean that's I know that's not that's not logically coherent. You know what I'm saying? It's an all right one. I was more thinking about something like to do with with genetics or something where where like this technology would explicitly help you to do, you know, the the work that you want to do. What what does that look like for you? The work that I'm doing. Time right machine, now, by the way, isn't a bad answer. So okay, um, okay. So one thing is this is probably going to happen at some point in the next ten to twenty years. So right now to do genomic sequencing, it's like we're in the era of mainframe computers. Mm -hmm. Like you need a a big box somewhere. And you need like a bunch of workers that do like library preps and like a clean room and blah blah blah. That's fine. Um, the dream, and some companies are working on this, um, is that you have like a small little device, and maybe you could spit into it or get a little pinprick. Um, you do have some blood. I'm sorry, Elizabeth. Uh, you know, but um, whatever. Actually, blood's not often the best for amplification of DNA. But in any case, um, you know, cheek swab. I don't know, but you could put it in some little cartridge, pop it into this. And you could sequence whatever, right. like whatever. A, a USB feedable. Yeah. And so sort right of now, deal. one of the issues technically about sequencing is it takes the genome of three billion and smashes it into into pieces of two hundred bases length, and then it reassembles it with 
parallel computing and clusters and all that stuff, right? It's a, it's a, it's an algorithmic problem. It wasn't possible before the last 20 years. It's really compute intense. Um, I can tell you for a fact we do it uh, at Generate. Um, for people, it's just a common thing people do, but it's intense. Are you, know? you using the regular CPU or is this more of a GPU type it's a, of? It's more of a, if you want to scale, you could do, you have to do GPU, but Got I it. have used CPUs before. Um, I have done it with CPUs. It depends on how big your genome is and stuff like that. But anyways, for humans, you want to do GPU probably if you don't want to like wait a while, you so, know? So give me, give me a number. What does this look like on like, you know, on, on sort of X number of, of, of GPUs? How long is it going to take to sequence? <sighs> My, for instance, my DNA or, or something. Well, to, to assemble it, assemble it. I think um, I'm trying to think of something we did. I think we got one of it down to uh, like three hours on like fourteen. It's not bad, but it's expensive. I mean, on fourteen GPUs, that's 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 heavy yeah. compute time. I think that yeah, it, it's not trivial. Um, so that's expensive because it's 200 seg 200 length segments right. to assemble it together and to do the tiling is really expensive algorithmically so the dream is to have a technology that you have a little uh, sample like that and then when it reads out the dna it reads out thousands tens of thousands maybe the whole chromosome and so then it can be assembled very easily and very quickly right and so that would make the sample collection trivial and it would make the assembly trivial mm -hmm. not the assembly but the alignment trivial um Actually, you could just assemble your own genome. You don't actually need to align. So I say alignment because you have a reference genome and you align it to that to make it much easier. But if you don't have a reference genome, you assemble it, which is you do the tiling. Well, if you have if you have like whole chromosomes being sequenced, you don't you don't need to align it. Like you got the whole chromosome, right? And so that's the dream. Um, there's a technology. Uh, there's a company called Oxford Nanopore that has like I think I've heard like 150,000 base pair lengths. As opposed to 200, hmm. that's a massive increase. Massive. Uh, that's a massive increase. Their their issue right now is like their accuracy is a little low, so they're good for scaffolding and creating the reference, but not the. Anyway, my only point is, I think in 10 years we're going to get to the point where we might have that. Okay, and that means that you know a sequencer at every table, on every kitchen table, uh, in every house, um, just be like Siri. Can you sequence that? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you could have That'd like a, you could have a Roomba sequencer. <laughs> That'd be amazing. <laughs> the Roomba sequencing everything. Oh yeah. The Roomba. Are you sequencing that dog's vomit? <laughs> yes, I am. <laughs> Outstanding. That'd be that. That would actually be a a, a pretty phenomenal technology to have out there. Um, well, I mean, you would you would you know. Um, so I give you like two quick examples. Sure. Um, uh, one is like Mike Snyder's genetics at Stanford discovered 10 years ago that he had type 2 diabetes and he didn't understand like what the trigger was because he was thin, blah, blah, blah. Well, they, he went back and looked and um, he had a company at that time named Personalis. I think he has like a follow-up company. Anyway, he was tracking his insulin levels and he was tracking like I think cytokines and stuff from immune responses. Mm. And it turned out he had a massive, massive infection and his insulin levels went out of control right oh. at that moment. So the infection triggered type 2 diabetes, okay? And so my point is we can know a lot more about the origin of diseases and the correlations of disease triggers um, if we have these data, okay? Um, you know, personal genomic data along with these biomarker data and stuff like that. The other thing is, like, as you know, um, with sewage data, you get, like, you know, COVID sequences or RNA from, you know, whatever. You get, like, you get knowledge of what's going on in COVID. So imagine, I think this is going to happen. In the near future, you have a toilet. And the toilet does, like, basically what the Star Trek's tricorder does. Every single day, you got to go. Because the issue is, like, if you make it's it... It's just a, analyzing yeah, fecal matter. Yeah, yeah. And, like, you know, like, 50% of heart attacks, you have, like, no idea. You have no idea. And it's just, like, a surprise. But the reality is, there's often precursors. So imagine that you go to go to the bathroom, and then it's just, like... Go to the hospital right now. There's something going on with you. Um, could be a massive heart attack in 24 hours, right? That would make a huge difference. Massive difference. Right? So these are these are the futures that I imagine. Um, Instead of those, you know, weird smart toilets that you know, you know blow air in your butt and various. Oh, other you mean things. a bidet? Yeah. Well, oh, no, let's call it a health bidet. Let's call it a health. <laughs> let's call it a medical bidet. I, th I think there's some crazy ones out there that yeah, I, I sort of always, ex always experienced Japanese. in Europe, okay. or excuse me, in uh, in uh, in Asia. Okay. But at the same time, you're talking about an actual smart one. Like, hey, you ha like there is an issue here that you need to go. Well, I mean, know, yeah, go, like go imagine, tell someone about. Imagine, for example, like I don't know, like um, colon cancer or something. 
That yeah. you could imagine it would automatically detect very quickly. That'd be amazing. Because it's near the end of the, you know. But there's other things like, um, uh, you know, I had a friend who died of pancreatic cancer. Well, I had mul- multiple people that I knew, but one of them was a friend who died of pancreatic cancer. Yeah. The issue with pancreatic cancer is like the pancreas is in the middle of your body. And it's apparently like really hard to catch it early. Right. But like when it's metastasizing early, it must be like shedding cancer, you know. It's got to be showing up somewhere. We should be able to have ways to detect it in the near future. Um, and in that case, like imagine again, because like stuff goes out of you with your stool. Like it's a lot. It's a lot of bacteria. It's a lot of fiber, but it's also a lot of your cells. Right. Right. And so imagine that you can detect really, really early stage cancers that way. Like that's a dream. And we and like if we could, we actually have the chemo technology, you know, because a lot of this chemotherapy is like, oh, you know, if we had gotten it at stage one or whatever instead of the stage it's at you'd be fine it's just we didn't get it because you know we don't normally do biopsies on healthy people sure and there's reasons false positives that you don't but imagine you had the information and you had the technology and you could act on it um it's not rocket science like you're talking to rocket scientists this is not rocket science this is science that we have the pieces and we need to snap it together and what's holding us back is um you know people want to do like design, well, I mean, I stopped playing video games in 94, um, but I mean, I'm just saying like video games are fine, but a lot of our mental um, firepower, you know, during the financial crisis, you know, I had friends that were physicists who were financial engineers and like, look, they weren't adding that much value. I mean, I'm kind of libertarian, but like, let's be honest, they weren't adding that much value with liquidity and stuff like that. Sure. They were just making money off uh, volatility, right? So this was like a brain a- applied to things to not like actually make humans flourish into the future, but optimize their own well-being. Anyway. That's that's all good. There, I think there's a famous saying uh, in in the tech in the you know specifically the the software world, which is most of the smartest minds of my generation have gone into trying to get people to click ads as often. Yeah, as yeah, possible. exactly. And that that is that is the 2020 version. The, I mean, there's there, there's something to be said for it, but at the same time, yeah, I hear you. Um, it seems like we could be we could definitely be you know exploring more than we do. Well, I mean, okay, this is I'm mean, really quickly. This is not just that. Like, our interest rates are going up. This is not going to be happening anymore. I know multiple people that were hired by a fan company, usually Google, Facebook, and Apple, to be honest. Mm-hmm. I think there's so much Netflix and Amazon doing this, um, especially Amazon. Hired people and then tasked them with nothing. They were simply hired so that the other company could not hire them. Yep. And that's only because they had a lot of money. That's cheap money. That has definitely occurred before. And that is like... That is like a detriment to society in so many ways. Well, unless they work for a company, you know, evil person. Do you, you know what I'm saying, though? Absolutely. It's like a person with who's brilliant, who's hired to do nothing, so that he doesn't do he or she doesn't do something for another company. That that ha- it's a strategy. It happens from time to time. Yeah. But listen, this has been absolutely incredible. I love your answer, uh, especially to this to this. I mean, you've been great the whole time, but especially this last question. Um, just sort of these portable portable sequels, sequencers and analyzers would be unbelievable. Yeah. Um, Star Trek. Get a tr- yeah. tremendous amount of value. Yeah. Razib, thanks so much, buddy. Yeah. Appreciate it. Yeah. Um, for everybody listening, um, we have been standing on the shoulders of giants. Thank you. Um, David Mackay and Razib Khan signing off.